Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels, wishing all of you a good day. I hope you all are doing well and are having a fantastic week. Now, in case you don't know it, but you probably do know it since you clicked on this video, we are now about to start another complete timeline series about another famous ship on this channel. And what ship are we going to be talking about? Well, we're going to be talking about the RMS Lusitania. The RMS Lusitania was a passenger liner developed and built by the Canard Line, and the Canard Line was one of the biggest competitors to the White Star Line, the company that built the Titanic. And what makes the Lusitania famous from history is that on May 7, 1915, as the Lusitania was carrying passengers from New York City to the UK, the Lusitania was spotted and sunk by a German U-boat. You have to remember, during this time period, World War I was raging in Europe. And you see, the fact that a German U-boat would torpedo a passenger liner, not a military ship, and this passenger liner was full of passengers, you know, and civilians, not military personnel, sparked great controversy all over the world. And while it wasn't the main reason, the sinking of the Lusitania was a factor that would get the U.S. involved in the First World War. So, join me in today's video as we now tell the complete story of the RMS Lusitania, and we try to shed light on what happened to this famous vessel lost to history. The story of the Lusitania officially began several years before the ship was even built. Before I can properly tell you the story of the Lusitania itself, we must first travel back in time to a time period before the ship was constructed, so I can better tell you about the world that the Lusitania would be born into. Because you need to understand the series of events that would eventually lead to the Lusitania being constructed, and that way you'll have a better understanding as to why the Lusitania was so desperately needed in the world. In the late 1800s to the early 1900s, one of the fastest growing industries in the world was that of the passenger steamship companies. Because these companies were allowing immigrants a new and safer way to cross the Atlantic in order to start a new life in America. During this time period, there were more and more people wanting to leave Europe behind and try to have a, or start a new life for themselves over in the United States. And these steamship companies were ready to capitalize on this by offering these people a new and safer way to cross the Atlantic. You have companies like the Canard Line, the White Star Line, the Holland American Line, just to name a few examples. And all of these companies were trying to best each other. You know, they were always trying to do things to convince people to sail on their ships instead of the competition. These companies were always trying to build the biggest ships in the world, the fastest ships in the world, the most luxurious ships in the world. You know, everybody at these companies were trying to think, what can we do to make people sail on our ships instead of the competition? And for a while, Canard Line was one of the top companies in the world that were offering immigrants a safe and effective way to cross the Atlantic on their ships. They even had the fastest ships in the world for a while. However, in the late 1890s, Canard Line's status as one of the top steamship companies began to change, as they were slowly but surely being bested by their competition. And they also saw a dramatic decrease in ridership because all of their passengers were now moving to the competition due to the new ocean liners that their competition was bringing to the table. In the late 1890s, the Canard Line wasn't all that concerned with the White Star Line in terms of competition. They were more concerned about two German steamship companies in particular, more specifically the German NDL Line and the German Hamburg American Line. These companies were quickly overtaking the Canard Line by offering bigger, faster, and more luxurious ships than what the Canard Line could offer. And due to the fact that these ships departed from German ports and not British ports like the Canard Line did, it was easier for immigrants migrating from Europe to America to board these German ships instead of the British ones. And because of this, the Canard Line saw their ridership greatly diminish. The first big blow to the Canard Line, and what really clued them in that they needed to pay more attention to these German steamship companies, was the fact that in the year 1897, the Canard Line lost the Blue Ribbon. For those of you who don't know, the Blue Ribbon is an award given to a ship that is the fastest at crossing the Atlantic. Up until this year, the Canard Line had it. They first got it in the year 1893 with their new steamship, the RMS Campania. However, the Campania's sister ship, the RMS Lucania, stole the Blue Ribbon from the Campania. But it was still in the Canard family of ships, so the Canard Line didn't care that much. However, in the year 1897, the NDL Line launched their brand new vessel, the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, which was the world's very first four-funnel steamship. And just six months after this vessel entered service, it stole the blue ribbon from the RMS Lucania. And this really signaled an end to the Canard Line's dominance. 
And if they wanted to stay relevant in the steamship passenger trade, then they would really have to step up their game and come out with some brand new ships in order to compete with these brand new German superliners. Over the next several years, the Cunard Line would continue to operate and they would succeed in building several new vessels. However, from what information I could find about these ships, it doesn't seem like these ships made any significant impact with the public. The most famous vessel that I could find built during this period was the RMS Carpathia, which was built in the year 1903. But this ship really wouldn't become famous until around 10 years later when it helped rescue the survivors from the Titanic disaster. So, from 1897 onward, it seems like the Cunard Line was slipping further and further from the public's eye, because the public was now shifting their focus towards the brand new German superliners, which were quickly becoming the most popular way to cross the Atlantic. Now, several years before the Carpathia was even built, another severe blow was dealt to the Cunard Line, and this occurred in the year 1901 and was caused by a man named J.P. Morgan. In case you don't know, J.P. Morgan was an American businessman and millionaire. And in the year 1901, he decided that he wanted to invest heavily in the transatlantic shipping industry, and he wanted to create a brand new company. This company would eventually become known as the International Mercantile Marine Company, or IMM for short. In the year 1901, when he started up IMM, he wanted to bring in a bunch of smaller companies and merge them with IMM so he could basically create a monopoly on the transatlantic shipping industry. One of the first things that J.P. Morgan did with his brand new company was he went out and purchased a small British freight shipping company known as Frederick Leyland & Co. This happened in the year 1901, and then not long after that, he went out and purchased a controlling interest in another company, a company that many of you are probably familiar with. This company would be known as the White Star Line, and this is the company that owned the Titanic. Once he did this, he then folded the White Star Line into IMM. Then, one year later, J.P. Morgan and his team at IMM negotiated a deal with the NDL line and the Hamburg American line. They basically set up a community of interest agreement where they would try to fix prices and divide among the three companies the transatlantic trade. And then, not long after that, the partners at IMM also acquired a 51% stake in the Dutch Holland American line. Believe it or not, IMM even tried to purchase the Cunard line, an offer that the Cunard line refused. So, as you can plainly see, it didn't take IMM very long to really get established in the transatlantic shipping industry once they got up and running. I mean, it didn't take long for them to acquire several companies and then work out deals with other companies for their benefit. Now, while IMM was busy doing all this, the people over at Canard were getting more and more nervous because if IMM continued doing this, then according to the head of Canard, he saw this as a possible threat to the entire British shipping industry. So, he did the only thing he could do. He went to the British government for help, because if something wasn't done, IMM could take over as the leading transatlantic shipping industry company in the world. The head of the Cunard Line, a man by the name of George Burns, approached the British government and explained to them what was going on with IMM and the Cunard Line. He explained to them the threat that IMM possessed to the entire British shipping industry. So, after some negotiating, the British government agreed to give the Cunard Line a loan of £2.6 million in June of 1903 in order to help the Cunard Line finance the construction of two brand new revolutionary ocean liners. It was the Cunard Line's hope that these two brand new ships would give the Cunard Line and the British shipping industry the break that it needed in order to properly fight against IMM and stop them from gaining a monopoly on the entire transatlantic shipping industry. And in case you didn't guess it, but I'm guessing you did, these two ships would eventually become known as the RMS Lusitania and the RMS Mauritania. These two ships would definitely play a huge role in helping the Cunard Line keep IMM from gaining complete control into the transatlantic shipping industry. Alright, so now it's time to continue the complete timeline story of the RMS Lusitania. Now, in episode one, if you remember, we left off at the point where the head of the Cunard Line was meeting with the British government to see if he could get a loan from them in order to help finance the construction of two brand new revolutionary ocean liners. These ships would become known as the Lusitania and the Mauritania if the head of the Cunard Line could get funding for these vessels. If he could not succeed in getting funding from the British government to help build these ships, then the Lusitania would never come to be. 
However, this turned out to not be an issue. When the head of the Canard Line, a man by the name of George Burns, met with the British government to discuss the situation, the British government agreed to give the Canard Line a loan of £2.6 million in June of 1903 to help finance the construction of two brand new revolutionary ocean liners. However, in order for the Canard Line to get this loan from the government, the British government had very strict technical specifications that they wanted to have implemented into their new ships in order for the Canard Line to get a loan from them. The reason the British government gave the Canard Line strict technical specifications that these new vessels had to meet in order to get a loan from them was because that, in the event that war should break out, the British government wanted to be able to use these vessels for military purposes. More specifically, they wanted to be able to use these new ships as armed merchant cruisers. The technical specifications that the British government wanted for these new ships are of the following. Number one, the ships had to have a double bottom. Number two, the new ships also had to be divided into watertight subdivisions for safety. Number three, and this is a pretty unique concept, the British government wanted the ship's coal bunkers to be positioned along the outer hull. That way, in case of a hull breach, the coal bunker itself could act as a watertight bulkhead, protecting the interior sections of the ship from flooding. Now, while in theory, the whole idea of putting a ship's coal bunker along the outer hull does seem like a good way to protect the interior sections of a ship from flooding. In practical standpoint, I'm not really sure how well this would work out because, well, I'll tell you my reasons here in a second. You see, traditionally, the way ships usually handle coal bunkers is that they don't position them along the ship's hull. They actually have the coal bunkers cut through the ship's interiors along each of the ship's individual bulkheads. So let's compare the Lusitania's design with another ship like the Titanic. The way the Titanic handled its coal bunkers was that the Titanic was divided up into 16 individual watertight bulkheads, and then the coal bunkers for the Titanic went along each of the Titanic's bulkheads. So if you were in one of the Titanic's engine rooms, or boiler room I should say, and you looked at the Titanic's watertight bulkhead in there, you wouldn't see the bulkhead. You would see the coal bunker in front of the watertight bulkhead. And then if you looked at the Titanic's hull, you would just see the hull. However, it was flipped with the Lusitania. You see, the way the Lusitania handled it was, if you looked at the Lusitania's watertight bulkhead, then you would just see the bulkhead. However, if you looked at the Lusitania's hull from the interior section, then you wouldn't see the hull. You would see a coal bunker in front of the hull. Now, I spoke to Mike over at the Ocean Liner Designs channel about this whole idea, and he also told me that while the idea is interesting, and in theoretical terms, it seems like it might work, in practical use, he wasn't so sure, because in the event of a hull breach, trying to shut a coal bunker door and make that small section of the ship watertight, well, that really wasn't the easiest thing to do, mostly because of the pressure involved of trying to shut a coal bunker door with tons and tons of seawater blasting through an opening. So, as I said, in terms of theoretical, it's an interesting idea, but in terms of practical use at the time, I'm not really sure how well that whole thing would have worked out. There were three more requirements that the British government wanted to have implemented on these brand new ships. Number one, they wanted the ships to have reinforced decks, so if the ships had to have guns mounted to them, it would be simple to do so. They also required that these ships remain under British ownership. And the last and probably the most challenging technical requirement that the British government wanted on these ships was they wanted these ships to be able to maintain a speed of at least 24 and a half knots. Now, while this speed requirement doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal at first, it was a bigger deal than what you might realize. Because it's easy to build a relatively small ocean liner and fit it with a bigger engine and have this ship be able to maintain a higher rate of speed. However, this wasn't the vision Canard Line had for this whole new class of liner. They wanted these ships to not only be some of the fastest in the world, but they also wanted these ships to be one of the largest, if not the largest, ship ever built. They also wanted these ships to be unmatched in style and luxury. You know, they wanted the public to marvel at these new ships. So this speed requirement was definitely going to be an issue for the Canard Line. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. For now, the only thing you need to know is, is that the Canard Line got the funding it needed from the British government to begin construction on these ships. And Canard Line's vision for this whole new class of liner was finally coming to life. Now, when they were first planning out the design of these new ships, the original plan was that these ships would have three funnels. However, after learning about the speed requirements needed by the British government, the Canard Line decided to add a fourth funnel so they could put more boilers into the ship, and that way they could accommodate a bigger and more powerful engine. This is why, at the end, 
these brand new ships would end up being four funnel ocean liners. Throughout the rest of 1903 and into the early months of 1904, the final plans for these ships was completed, minus one very important detail that we'll talk about in a minute. But it was also decided around this time what these two new ships would be called. The first ship to be built would be called the Lusitania, and then its sister ship that would be built soon after would be called the Mauritania. Once the Cunard Line was ready to begin construction on these two brand new ships, they were anxious for work to begin as quickly as possible. But you see, the thing is, the Cunard Line didn't want work to just proceed on one ship. They wanted work to proceed on both ships at exactly the same time. They didn't want construction on the Lusitania to be a few months further along than that on the Mauritania. They wanted both of these ships to be built at exactly the same time, that way both of these ships could enter service at exactly the same time. By doing this, the Cunard Line thought that they would be in a better position to fight against IMM and stop them from monopolizing the North Atlantic trade route. So, what the Cunard Line ended up doing was, they had both the Lusitania and Mauritania be built at exactly the same time, however, they had them both being built in two separate shipyards. That way, they wouldn't have to wait around for one shipyard to do some work on the Lusitania before they began work on the Mauritania. And honestly, this plan worked out pretty well for the Cunard Line. The keel for the Lusitania was laid down on August 17, 1904 at a shipyard called John Brown & Co. in Scotland, and its sister ship Mauritania had her keel laid down just one day later on August 18, 1904 at a shipyard called John Richardson & Swan Hunter in Northumberland, England. Now, even though work had already begun on both the Lusitania and the Mauritania, there was one very crucial design element that had yet to be decided on on both of these ships. And because this design element hadn't been decided yet, this would severely limit how much work could be done on both the Lusitania and the Mauritania. You see, if you were in the shipyards where these ships were being built, you would notice that the process of building these ships was going pretty differently than what you would traditionally see on other ships built during this time period. The shipyard workers were prioritizing building the front sections of the ship instead of the back sections of the ship. This was because the Cunard Line, even at this late stage in the game, had yet to decide what type of engines to put in both the Lusitania and the Mauritania. Remember how earlier in this video I said that there was one design element that had yet to be decided on these ships? Well, what type of engine they were going to use was exactly what they had not yet decided on yet. And until they decided on what type of engine to use on both of these ships, the process of building both of these vessels would be severely limited. The reason the Cunard Line had yet to decide what type of engine to use in these new ships was due to the speed requirement imposed on the Cunard Line by the British government. Initially, the Cunard Line planned to use the traditional reciprocating engine in both the Lusitania and the Mauritania. However, they weren't sure that this engine would be able to meet the speed requirements imposed on them by the British government due to how large the Lusitania and Mauritania were planned to be. However, the Cunard Line did have an engine in mind that may, just may, be able to help the Lusitania and Mauritania reach the speed requirements needed by the British government. This engine was called the Parsons Steam Turbine, and it was a revolutionary, brand new engine. And even though this engine had proven successful in early tests, it had never been implemented on a vessel as big as the Lusitania and Mauritania. So the Cunard Line wasn't sure if they should put these engines in their new ships or experiment with another means to get these ships to reach the speed requirements needed by the British government. The first vessel to ever use the steam turbine engine was a small ship called the Turbinia. This vessel was basically a proof of concept ship. The only purpose of this vessel was to test the steam turbine. The vessel entered service in the year 1894, and although the engine did work, it didn't reach anywhere near the speeds that those who built the ship expected. So they went back to the drawing board, made some design changes, and added a few more propellers to the ship, giving this small vessel a grand total of nine propellers. Yes, you heard me right, this small ship had nine propellers on it. Once they made these changes, they did another test with the vessel in the year 1897, and this ship reached speeds of up to 34.5 knots, or roughly 40 miles per hour. This was an unheard of speed at the time period, and this ship was, at the time, the fastest ship in the world. So honestly, this vessel did prove the potential of the steam turbine. Now even though the initial test results of the steam turbine engine appeared to be promising, it wasn't all perfect with this new engine. Even though it appeared that the steam turbine was more powerful than the traditional reciprocating engine, there were a few drawbacks. 
Number one, they noticed that this engine used a lot, and I mean a lot more fuel than the traditional reciprocating engine. So that was one problem. There were also issues with these engines vibrating a lot, which could make traveling on any ship with these engines a bit uncomfortable. And there was also an issue with these engines didn't always perform as expected. You see, there were quite a few ships that used the steam turbine from the time period of the Turbinia up to the time period that the Lusitania and Mauritania were being built. And honestly, the results of the steam turbine were kind of a mixed bag. So that's why the Canard line was initially skeptical of using this engine in their new ships. Probably the most famous account of the steam turbine engine not performing as expected had to do with a ship called the RMS Victorian. This was the very first transatlantic ocean liner to be equipped with the steam turbine engine, and this vessel was nowhere near as big as the Lusitania and Mauritania were going to be. During the initial sea trials of the Victorian, which happened in December of 1904, the ship failed to reach the 17-knot speed requirement as stipulated in her contract. So, as a result of this, the Canard Line lost faith in the steam turbine engine, and until further tests could be run on the engine, they temporarily decided to halt construction of the Lusitania and Mauritania. Now, initially everyone, including those of the Canard Line, thought that the main reason that the Victorian failed to reach her projected speed was due to some unforeseen problem with the turbine engine. So this is the main reason why they decided to halt work on the Lusitania and Mauritania, because up until this point, the Canard Line was almost certain that they were going to use this engine in their new ships. However, upon further examination, it was discovered that the real reason the Victorian failed to reach her projected speeds was due to some design problem with the ship itself and not the engine. However, I don't blame the Canard Line for halting work on the Lusitania and Mauritania, because think about how this must look from their perspective. You've got this brand new, untested engine, and this engine, while it has potential, has a lot of problems, you know? It uses a lot more fuel, it has vibration issues, and then on top of that, it doesn't seem like it can consistently make a ship run at a projected speed. So honestly, I can't blame the Canard Line for being skeptical of this engine. However, even with all of this, they weren't ready to throw in the towel with this engine just yet. Because in 1905, they had it within their means to perform an experiment with this engine. And this experiment would prove once and for all if the Canard Line was going to use the turbine in their new ships or switch back to a more conventional engine. When we last left the RMS Lusitania, the Canard Line had just begun construction on this brand new revolutionary ocean liner. However, even though the Canard Line was working on the ship, they were only focusing on building the bow part of the ship and not the stern. This was because an important design decision had yet to be reached. The Canard Line did not know what kind of engine the brand new Lusitania and its sister ship RMS Mauritania would use. They were trying to decide between the traditional reciprocating engine or the brand new steam-powered turbine, which, although the turbine had been successful in early tests, the engine had not yet been used in a big ship like the Lusitania. So the Canard Line wasn't very comfortable with using it on the new ship yet. However, the Canard Line did have a way to test the engine to see if it would prove successful in the brand new Lusitania and Mauritania. At the exact same time that the Lusitania and Mauritania were under construction, the Canard Line also had two other smaller ocean liners currently being built. So the Canard Line decided to use both of these ships to perform an experiment to ultimately decide if the turbine engine was worth using instead of the traditional reciprocating engine. You see, these two ships were the Caronia and the Carmania. And what the Canard Line was going to do was they were going to put the traditional reciprocating engine in one ship, and then they were going to put the steam-powered turbine in another ship. And then they were going to basically put these two ships into a competition with each other and see which one won. And then based on this little competition or experiment or whatever you want to call it, they would ultimately decide if the steam-powered turbine was worth using in the new Lusitania and Mauritania. The Canard Line decided to run this experiment with these two ships in January of 1905. What they did was they decided to have the Caronia have the traditional reciprocating engine since that ship would be completed first. In fact, the Caronia would be ready to go just one month later in February of 1905. However, its sister ship Carmania wouldn't be done until December of 1905. So, because this ship wasn't as far along in the construction process, it made this vessel the perfect candidate to receive the brand new steam-powered turbine. 
Although, even though the Canard Line did have this plan in place, that did not mean that they would have to wait nearly a year before they would ultimately decide if the steam powered turbine was going to be used in the Lusitania and Mauritania. Now, even though the Canard Line did have to wait roughly a year before they could ultimately decide what type of engine to use in the Lusitania and Mauritania, they did not stop construction on these two ships during that time frame. Basically what they did was they just had the construction teams work around the back part of the ship where the engines would go and you know they just tried to carry on as best they could. But the work definitely proceeded more slowly with the Lusitania and Mauritania throughout 1905 while they waited to find out what type of engine both of these ships would utilize. Then in December of 1905, the RMS Carmania was finally completed and ready to be put to sea. Once this vessel entered service, the Canard Line wasted no time in testing the Carmania against its sister ship Coronia to see which ship would outperform the other. And as expected, the Carmania outperformed the Coronia with its brand new steam turbine engine. So with this experiment completed, the Canard Line finally knew that the steam turbine engine would work in their new ships. So they decided to put the steam turbine engine in the Lusitania and Mauritania and construction could finally resume on these vessels at full speed. Once the Canard Line decided on what engine both of these ships would use, it didn't take very long for the shipyard to finish work on the Lusitania and Mauritania's hull. The Lusitania was launched on June 7, 1906, and its sister ship Mauritania was only a few months behind. The Mauritania's hull was launched in September of 1906. So, with both of these vessels now in the water, work could begin on finishing out their interiors, getting all the funnels attached, and basically doing everything they needed to in order to turn the hull of both of these vessels into the beautiful transatlantic ocean liners that they were always destined to be. Alright, so with everything that the Canard Line has had to go through so far with the building of the Lusitania, Surely, now that the vessel is in the water, and now that they've decided on what type of engine the ship is going to use, they've passed all the really difficult stuff with the Lusitania. It's going to be nothing but smooth sailing for the rest of the Lusitania and Mauritania's construction process, right? Well, you would be right, and you would be wrong at the exact same time. In terms of finishing up building the Lusitania, work would proceed rather smoothly. Although, when they finally got to the time period at which it was time to begin the Lusitania sea trials, well, they would discover another major problem with the vessel that would have to be addressed before the Lusitania could head out on its maiden voyage. Work on the Lusitania was completed in the summer of 1907. However, before this vessel went to undergo her official sea trials, the people at Canard Line wanted the ship to go through a preliminary sea trial just to get a feel for what the vessel was capable of. This was because where the ship had the brand new turbine engine, they wanted to see what the ship could do before she was officially judged and deemed whether or not she was seaworthy enough to take on passengers. Now, the Canard Line decided to have this preliminary trial, or otherwise known as a builder's trial at the time, on July 27, 1907. And they invited people from the British Board of Trade, from the Admiralty, members of the Canard Line staff, people from the shipyard. They invited all these people to come out and see how the Lusitania would perform on her first time out at sea. And for the most part, these preliminary trials went okay. The big highlight for the trial was when they accelerated the Lusitania to maximum speed. The vessel reached speeds of somewhere around 25 to 25 and a half knots, which exceeded the British Admiralty's requirements for the speed requirements of the Lusitania. So this part of the trial was a big success. However, there was one big problem. When the Lusitania was operating at maximum speed, the vibrations generated by the steam turbine engines were so severe in the aft end sections of the ship, or at least in parts of the aft end section, that it made those spaces on the ship nearly uninhabitable. Basically what this means was if you were in one of those back rooms of the ship when they accelerated the Lusitania up to full speed, you would be shaking like crazy as the Lusitania's engines were running. So as you can imagine, the people at Canard Line weren't happy about this and work would have to be done on these sections of the ship before the Lusitania could, pr could proceed on her maiden voyage. However, the Canard Line noticed that the vibration issues with the Lusitania were the worst when the ship was running at maximum speed. If they decreased the speed a bit while the vibrations weren't completely gone, they were more manageable. So, after the builder's trial was complete, before any work was done with the Lusitania, they were comfortable enough to invite a few VIP guests on board to have a bit of a shakedown cruise, so to speak. These VIP guests spent a couple of days on board the ship, and the Canard Line wanted to see what they thought of the Lusitania. 
They also took this time to test the Lusitania under various speeds. However, they never got the ship up to her maximum speed to minimize the vibration issue. And this shakedown cruise went well, and the VIP guests departed the vessel on July 29, 1907. And then, right after they left, the official sea trials for the Lusitania began. The Lusitania's official sea trials took place over a three-day period. Now, one of the first things the Canard Line did with members of the Board of Trade who came to check out the vessel was inform them about the vibration issue with the ship. The Board of Trade basically told them what you can expect. You know, they needed to get that looked at before the Lusitania could head out on its maiden voyage. But besides the vibration issue, the sea trials for the Lusitania went perfectly. The ship was highly maneuverable, and believe it or not, when they did a full speed test with the Lusitania, they were able to get it to somewhere around 26 to 26 and a half knots, which was incredible for the time. They even did a full-on stop test, which means they had the Lusitania travel at near full speed or at full speed, and then they told the engines to run at full stern to try to stop the ship as fast they could, and believe it or not, they were able to stop the ship in somewhere around four minutes, which was incredible. The Lusitania was also highly maneuverable, and honestly, she passed the test with flying collars, minus the whole vibration issue. So, once the Board of Trade said, yep, the Lusitania is good, just get the vibration issue solved, Canard Line took the Lusitania and had the ship head back to the shipyard, where they would try to get the vibration issue addressed. And then, after that, the Lusitania was free to head out on its maiden voyage. When the Lusitania returned to the shipyard, what the Canard Line did in order to try to minimize the vibrations of the vessel was to add more steel beams and arches to the back end section of the Lusitania. However, in order to do this, they had to take apart entire second class spaces on board the ship and then rebuild them. Now, they were successful in adding these steel beams and arches, and it did help with the vibrations some. However, they did not completely go away. And the whole process of trying to minimize the Lusitania's vibrations and deal with it was something that the Canard Line would continue to work on throughout the rest of the Lusitania's career. So, once the shipyard was finished working on the RMS Lusitania stern section, the Canard Line was more than ready to finally take possession of the Lusitania and have it travel on its maiden voyage. The Canard Line planned to have the Lusitania's maiden voyage occur on September 7, 1907. The ship was going to travel from Liverpool all the way to New York City. And the Canard Line hoped that when the Lusitania finally headed out to sea with passengers for the first time, this would signal in the beginning of a new era. An era at which Canard Line would finally be known as the world's greatest steamship company. On September 7th, 1907, at 4.30 p.m., the RMS Lusitania steamed into Liverpool for the first time in order to pick up passengers for her maiden voyage. Under the command of Captain James Watt, the Canard Line had their hopes high for this first crossing on board the Lusitania. But you see, the Canard Line also had another goal for the Lusitania's maiden voyage. They were hoping that the Lusitania would be able to win the Blue Ribbon on its first crossing, which would showcase to the world that the Lusitania wasn't only the biggest ship in the world, but she was also the fastest. Now, once the Lusitania arrived in Liverpool and began to pick up passengers, the ship didn't remain in Liverpool for very long. This wasn't like the Titanic's visit to Southampton, where the ship stayed there for around a week while it gathered up supplies and everything like that. The Lusitania was fully stocked and ready to go when it arrived in Liverpool, so the only thing it had to do once it arrived in port was pick up passengers and then head out again. So the ship arrived at roughly 4.30 p.m. on September 7th, 1907, and then by 9 p.m. she had all of her passengers aboard and steamed out of Liverpool to begin her maiden voyage. The next day, the ship arrived in Queenstown, Ireland at somewhere around 9 a.m., and once again, the ship just picked up more passengers, and then around noon, the RMS Lusitania steamed out of Queenstown, heading out into open sea to begin her first voyage across the Atlantic, bound for New York City. Now, for the most part, the Lusitania's first westbound crossing across the Atlantic went pretty smoothly. However, a few days into the voyage, a heavy fog moved in, and as a result of this fog, the Canard Line had to slow down the Lusitania. This, as a result, would affect the Lusitania's arrival time in New York City, which means that on the Lusitania's first voyage across the Atlantic, the ship failed to win the Blue Ribbon. However, despite the issue with the fog, the Lusitania's first westbound crossing was a huge success. The Lusitania arrived in New York City on September the 13th, 1907, and the entire voyage took 5 days and 54 minutes to complete. This is still a very impressive crossing time, despite the Lusitania being slowed down by fog. And believe it or not, the Lusitania only missed the Blue Ribbon by just 32 minutes. 
So even though the Lusitania didn't get the blue ribbon on its first westbound crossing, the Canard Line was hopeful that the Lusitania would still win the blue ribbon and become known as the fastest and biggest ship in the world. However, despite the Lusitania not winning the Blue Ribbon, hundreds of thousands of people still came to the pier to marvel at this brand new revolutionary ocean liner. They knew very soon that the Lusitania would claim the Blue Ribbon and would be the world's biggest and fastest ocean liner. Now, the Lusitania remained in New York City for precisely one week, and during that time, the Canard Line allowed the public to tour the Lusitania. And as a result of this, this caused the public to fall even more in love with this brand new revolutionary ocean liner. After spending one week in New York City, the RMS Lusitania raised anchor and steamed out of New York Harbor, bound for Liverpool once again for her first eastbound crossing across the Atlantic. And just like her first westbound crossing, the Lusitania would also make a quick stop in Queenstown along the way. Now, the Canard Line hoped that at least for her first eastbound crossing, maybe, just maybe, the Lusitania could win the Blue Ribbon for fastest eastbound crossing, if the weather was better, of course. However, the Canard Line's hopes for this were, quick, were quickly lost, because once again, the Lusitania encountered a very heavy fog, and the ship had to slow down once again for her first eastbound crossing across the Atlantic. This, as a result, would delay the Lusitania's arrival time. On this voyage, it took the Lusitania precisely five days and four hours to cross the Atlantic, a few hours longer than her first westbound crossing. So, unfortunately, once again, the Lusitania failed to win the Blue Ribbon. However, it wouldn't stay that way for very long. In October of 1907, the Lusitania was finally ready to begin another westbound voyage across the Atlantic and the Canard Line hoped that this time around, if the weather was better, the Lusitania would finally be able to claim the Blue Ribbon. And guess what? Canard Line got their wish. The weather was much better, and the Lusitania was now able to proceed across the Atlantic at her maximum speed. She crossed the Atlantic in just 4 days, 19 hours, and 53 minutes, officially making the Lusitania the fastest ship in the world, and finally securing the Blue Ribbon for the Lusitania. However, even though the Lusitania had finally succeeded in claiming the Blue Ribbon, the ship wouldn't be able to hold on to that title for very long, because in December of 1907, the Lusitania's sister ship, the RMS Mauritania, officially entered service and stole the Blue Ribbon from the Lusitania. However, this didn't bother the Canard Line that much, because it was the Lusitania's sister ship that claimed the Blue Ribbon. So as long as the Blue Ribbon was housed in the same family of ships, this didn't bother the Canard Line all that much. Now, the Canard Line would have had no way of knowing this in 1907, but the success of the Lusitania and Mauritania had gotten the attention of one of the Canard Line's biggest competitors, the White Star Line. You see, they saw the Lusitania and Mauritania as a big threat to their company. So the head of the White Star Line, a man by the name of J. Bruce Ismay, had a talk with J.P. Morgan, the head of IMM, and together they decided that they wanted to build some brand new ships to compete with the Lusitania and Mauritania. So, they went to the head of the Harland & Wolf shipyard, William Peary, and discussed the idea for these new ships with him. And he came up with the idea for a whole new class of liner. A liner designed not to compete with the Lusitania and Mauritania in terms of speed, but to try to outclass them in terms of luxury and size. Now eventually, this whole new class of liner would be called the Olympic class of ocean liners. And it would be comprised of three ships. These ships would become known as the Olympic, the second ship would be called the, you know what? I can't remember what this ship was called. I think this ship was really famous for some reason. It's called Thai something, Titan. It's something like that. Do any of you know? Please let me know in the chat below. <laughs> and then the third and final ship of the Olympic class would become known as the Britannic. Now, I'm not going to be going into any more detail about these ships in this series because this series is about the Lusitania. However, I've already done complete timeline series showcasing the story of all three of these ships. And if you would like to learn more and watch those videos, I will, I will include a link to those videos in the description below. Alright, jumping back to the Lusitania and Mauritania now. Over the next year or so, things proceeded pretty smoothly with both of these vessels, and no major incidents happened. Both ships continued to operate normally, and the public loved sailing on both of these vessels. Now, in the year 1909, the Canard Line took the Lusitania and swapped out her propeller blades, and believe it or not, the Lusitania was finally able to reclaim the Blue Ribbon from the Mauritania. However, it only did this with the westbound crossing, not the east. So, a bit of a rivalry broke out between the Lusitania and Mauritania. 
with each ship trying to outclass the other in terms of speed. And then, believe it or not, in July of 1909, the Lusitania succeeded in taking the entire Blue Ribbon in terms of both eastbound and westbound crossings from the Mauritania. However, this success was short-lived, because in the exact same month, the Mauritania once again stole the Blue Ribbon from the Lusitania. Now, the next major event to happen to the Lusitania occurred in October of 1909, when this ship participated in a celebration. You see, in New York City in October of 1909, there was a celebration going on called the Hudson Fulton Celebration. This celebration was to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the discovery of the Hudson River, and it was also there to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Robert Fulton's first successful commercial application of a paddle steamship. So because they were celebrating this steamship, they also took the opportunity during the celebration to showcase the latest in transportation technology. And this is why the Lusitania was on display during this celebration, because they were using it to showcase the latest in steamship technology. Now, believe it or not, steamships weren't the only uh, mode of transportation being showcased during this event. Believe it or not, the Wright brothers had their very own airplane on display during this celebration. And also, believe it or not, there's a photo of the Wright Brothers airplane with the Lusitania in the background. And guys, let me tell you, the historian in me just absolutely loves this picture because, I mean, I never, I never knew about this until I looked into it. And it's so cool to see the Wright Brothers airplane and the Lusitania in the same photo side by side. Now, a few months after the Hudson Fulton celebration, the first real major incident with the Lusitania occurred. On January 10, 1910, while the Lusitania was heading to New York City from Liverpool, the ship encountered a rogue wave roughly 75 feet high. Now, due to the design of the Lusitania, she was able to cut through the wave instead of riding on top of it. However, this came at a cost. As the wave washed over the ship, it slammed into the Lusitania's bridge. This, as a result, damaged the Lusitania's forecastle, and it also smashed every single window on the bridge. Now, the bridge itself was also pushed aft by a few inches. That just showcases the power of this wave. And it also put a permanent depression of a few inches in the Lusitania's decking and the bridge of the ship. However, despite this damage, the Lusitania wasn't at risk of sinking, so the ship continued on to New York. The ship arrived a few hours late, and luckily, no one was injured. The passengers of the Lusitania were just a little bit shaken up. After this event with the rogue wave happened, the Canard Line wasted no time in repairing the Lusitania and getting it put back out to sea as quickly as possible. And honestly, once this was done, things proceeded pretty smoothly with the Lusitania and its sister ship Mauritania over the course of the next few years. The passengers loved sailing on these vessels, Canard Line was a very popular company to sail with, and yeah, I mean, Canard Line couldn't ask for a better situation in terms of operating both the Lusitania and the Mauritania. However, that all changed on July 28, 1914, when a certain event occurred that would change the fate of both of these vessels forever. On July 28, 1914, World War I officially broke out and quickly spread across Europe. Now, as a result of war breaking out, it would have a noticeable impact on the entire transatlantic shipping industry. There isn't one vessel operating in the Atlantic that wouldn't be affected by this war in some way. And, of course, as you expected, this also means that the Lusitania and her sister ship Mauritania would also be impacted by this war. Not long after hostilities broke out, the British Admiralty contacted the Canard Line and let them know that they would need both the Lusitania, along with her sister ship Mauritania, to enter service as armed merchant cruisers as quickly as possible. However, not long after this happened, the British Admiralty did some tests with both the Lusitania and Mauritania and discovered that the engines on both of these vessels well, they really weren't suited to be used as armed merchant cruisers. Where the Lusitania and Mauritania were built to be the fastest ships on the Atlantic, the engines on these ships were efficient in terms of their coal usage if they were doing what they were intended to, to be used as very fast ships steaming across the Atlantic. The engines were great for this. However, in terms of being used as an armed merchant cruiser, which means that the Lusitania and Mauritania would be on patrol, sailing around the Atlantic very slowly, or these ships would be used as escort ships to help protect a convoy? Well, due to the slow speed that these ships would be going at during these time periods, the engines used way too much fuel for this. They just were not practical for this type of usage. So once the British Admiralty realized this, they decided that they did not need the Lusitania and Mauritania, at least during the early stages of the war. 
And as you can expect, Canard Line noticed that there was a huge drop off in civilian passengers wanting to sail across the Atlantic during this time period. I'm not saying that there were no people wanting to sail across the Atlantic during this time period, but there were much fewer numbers than usual. So what the Canard Line decided to do was put the RMS Mauritania in storage until this ship would be needed later. And then they decided to have the Lusitania continue operating for her transatlantic passenger service. So during the early stages of the war, the Lusitania continued to operate going to and fro, sailing across the Atlantic, taking passengers from Europe to America and America to Europe. Then, not long after the war broke out, Germany unleashed a new and devastating weapon onto the Atlantic, the U-boat. For those of you who don't know, a U-boat is a German war submarine that was capable of hunting down and torpedoing an enemy ship and causing it to sink. Now at first, the British Admiralty didn't take the existence of these U-boats too seriously. They really didn't think that these submarines could do any major damage to the British fleet. However, as more and more time went by, the UK government saw how many ships that these U-boats were starting to sink. So, as the war continued to rage on, the British Admiralty had no choice but to accept the fact that these U-boats were something to be reckoned with. Alright, so now that we've touched on what the Lusitania was doing during this time period, and now that we've also touched on what U-boats are and why they were considered such a threat, we, there is one more key thing that we need to discuss before we continue the story of the Lusitania, because by understanding this, you'll have a better understanding of the series of events that are about to occur with the Lusitania. You see, what we need to talk about is a treaty that was signed in the 1800s known as the Declaration of Paris. Now, I'm not going to be going into the full extent of this treaty, but the part of it that you need to understand for this video was that this treaty had very specific rules in place in regards to naval warfare. And this treaty was also signed by 55 countries, including Germany. So that's also a key reason as to why this treaty is a big deal and why it's very important to the story of the Lusitania. Now, the part of the Declaration of Paris that you all need to understand for the story of the Lusitania is a section of this declaration that is known as Cruiser Rules. And the whole point of the Cruiser Rules part of the declaration was to basically safeguard civilian vessels and civilian lives during a time of war. So, this is the easiest way I can explain it. Let's say you have a warship, okay, and it comes across an enemy civilian vessel. This vessel isn't carrying any armaments whatsoever. It's just full of innocent civilians. Well, under the cruiser rules, this warship should try to safeguard those civilian lives. So if they decide to sink the civilian ship, they have to make sure that all the civilians get off the ship before it sinks. Or if they wanted to, they could just do an inspection of this ship, make sure this ship wasn't carrying any weapons or anything like that, and then they could leave the ship alone. However, if they found that this civilian ship was carrying weapons, it could be classified as a ship of war and could be sunk. So this is the simplified version of the cruiser rules thing. You know, the only point of this was just to try to make sure that as few civilian lives were lost as possible. However, while on paper, cruiser rules obviously make sense, and I'm sure during wars of the past, they were easier to enforce. But during the First World War, as war technology was evolving rapidly and there were brand new machines of war being implemented, such as submarines and airplanes, it was getting to be harder and harder to safeguard civilian lives during this time period. This was partly due to the fact that while submarines and airplanes were very good tools of war, the downside of these weapons was that it was harder to use them and fine tune a target to make sure that you're only taking out a military ship or military installation. So because of this, it was inevitable that some civilian lives would be lost during this brand new era of technological warfare. Now, while we're on the subject of why both sides had an increasingly difficult time in fine tuning their targets, there was another issue that came up that made this even worse. You see, during this time period, there were a good number of neutral countries. And when I say neutral countries, I'm referring to countries that weren't directly associated with one side or the other. They were not involved with this war at all. So obviously, these countries weren't to be fired upon by either side. One such country was the United States of America. The U.S. would remain neutral during World War I until the final years of the war. And there's also a clause in the whole Declaration of Paris that helps protect these countries. You see, according to the cruiser rules, all vessels sailing across the Atlantic should have a flag up that lets other ships or U-boats know what country this ship belongs to. 
So if you have an American ship, it's supposed to have up an American flag. If you have a British ship, it's supposed to be hoisting a British flag and so on and so forth. This is to help protect the lives of people who aren't involved in this conflict. However, there was this growing issue during this time period where ships would hoist a false flag as a form of camouflage. Now, this directly violated the cruiser rules. This was not to be done under any circumstances because as a result of this, this made it more difficult for both sides to know, you know, if they were firing upon an enemy ship or not. So because of this, there were instances out there where British ships were hoisting American flags. And this became such a problem that U-boat captains started, you know, they were like, okay, I can't tell if that's an American ship or a British ship or not. So these U-boats would just assume the worst and torpedo all ships. So because this was a constantly growing problem, it was inevitable that innocent lives that had nothing to do with this conflict would be lost. All right, now that we've covered all of that information, we can now continue the story of the Lusitania. Now, for the first 9 to 10 months of the war, the Lusitania was very successful in avoiding trouble. Captaining the ship during this time period was a man by the name of Captain Dow, and he was very well familiar with the Lusitania, and he knew how to operate the vessel safely and efficiently. Now, after World War I broke out, Captain Dow was ordered to sail the Lusitania with no flags hoisted. This was also a violation of the cruiser rules, and Captain Dow strongly disagreed with this decision. However, he was forced to do this, so he grudgingly did it and didn't complain too much. After this happened, he continued to operate the Lusitania without issues. However, the stress of everything that was going on was beginning to get to Captain Dow. In March of 1915, he requested to be granted shore leave from the Lusitania, and this request was accepted. After Captain Dow left the Lusitania, Captain Turner returned to the Lusitania once again, and he would be the captain of the vessel throughout the rest of her career. Following Captain Turner's return to the Lusitania, for the next month or so, everything proceeded pretty smoothly with the ship. The Lusitania continued to operate, sailing back and forth across the Atlantic with no real problems. However, all that changed in May. You see, on May 1st of 1915, the RMS Lusitania was docked in New York City, getting ready to depart for another voyage from New York City to Liverpool. However, what everyone didn't know was that on this particular voyage, the fate of the Lusitania was about to be changed forever. Now, the Lusitania was due to leave New York City at 12 noon on the 1st of May, 1915. However, during the early hours of the morning on this same particular day, this would have been the time period at which all the Lusitania's passengers would have begun to board the vessel. Now, also right around this same time period, the Lusitania received some last-minute and unexpected and top-secret cargo. You see, secretly, the Lusitania was going to take some small arms munitions from the United States to Great Britain to help assist Britain with the war effort. The munitions included 4,200 cases of Remington rifle cartridges, 1,250 cases of shrapnel shells and fuses. Now, this cargo was to be kept a complete secret because, remember, at this time period, the U.S. was supposed to be neutral during World War I. And because the Lusitania was carrying these small arms munitions, this was a complete violation of the cruiser rules agreement, which meant that if the Lusitania was caught carrying these munitions, the Lusitania was a viable military target able to be sunk by German U-boats. Now, due to the fact that the Lusitania, a vessel that was supposed to be an unarmed civilian passenger liner, was carrying munitions illegally, would be a source of great controversy in later years. However, we'll talk more about that later. For now, the only thing you need to know is, yes, it was true that the Lusitania was illegally carrying munitions in order to help assist with the war effort. However, before we get more into that, what we need to talk about right now is, due to the fact that the U.S. was technically neutral in World War I at this time period, there was a German embassy located in New York City. And due to the fact that the Lusitania, an unarmed passenger liner, quote-unquote, was getting ready to sail across the Atlantic, the German embassy issued out a warning, letting all the civilians who were sailing on board the Lusitania know that a state of war existed between Great Britain and her allies, and that anybody who sails on board the Lusitania was doing so at their own risk. This warning appeared in the New York City newspapers at the time. And for the most part, most of the passengers on board the Lusitania just kind of 
laughed it off. You know, they were thinking, the Germans can't be serious. They wouldn't torpedo an unarmed civilian passenger liner. There is no way that this could happen. So this was the general consensus of the public at the time. However, there were a few people who were supposed to sail on the Lusitania who took this threat seriously and decided to cancel their voyage on board the Lusitania. Then, at a little bit past 12 noon on the 1st of May, 1915, RMS Lusitania pulled out of the pier and departed New York City, bound for Liverpool for the last time. A couple of hours after the Lusitania departed New York City, she passed a few British destroyers that were just off the coastline, and a crewman on board one of these destroyers took a photograph of the Lusitania as it was sailing out across the Atlantic. This photograph you see here of the Lusitania way off in the distance is the last known photograph to ever be taken of the Lusitania. When we last left the Lusitania, it was May 1st, 1915, and the ship had just departed New York City bound for Liverpool. Now, it was going to take the Lusitania roughly a week to cross the Atlantic and arrive in Liverpool. However, what everybody on board the Lusitania didn't realize was that at the exact moment the Lusitania was leaving New York, on the other side of the Atlantic, German U-boat U-20 had just left its home port and was heading to its patrol zone. And its patrol zone happened to be the area that the Lusitania would be steaming into in about one week's time. So, since it's going to take the Lusitania roughly a week to cross the Atlantic, what I thought we would do for this video is go ahead and jump to the other side of the Atlantic and tell a little bit of the history of U-20. Because, believe it or not, U-20 has an incredibly interesting history leading up to the point that it encountered the RMS Lusitania. And then we're going to conclude this video at the exact moment that U-20 encountered the Lusitania. And then in the next episode, we're going to talk about how U-20 eventually found the Lusitania, torpedoed it, and what events led up to the Lusitania eventually sinking after U-20 torpedoed it. Alright guys, well hey, with that out of the way, let's now tell the story of U-20, the submarine that would eventually sink the Lusitania. Now before we begin today's video, I do have one quick disclaimer I need to mention. The stories that I'm going to be telling you in this video are very obscure stories about U-20. And because these stories aren't easily accessible online, in fact, most of the research I did about U-20 came from the incredible book Dead Wake that talks about the final voyage of the Lusitania. And this book doesn't just talk about Lusitania, it also has a pretty detailed account of U-20. I wasn't able to find a lot of photos or pictures of U-20, so I had to improvise a little bit and show some other pictures of different U-boats to help out with the story. So if you notice a few pictures and you know, wait a minute, that's not U-20, just know that I had to improvise a little bit to give you all the content for this video. So give me a little bit of a break there. But yeah, guys, listen, I'm telling you, if you want to learn more about the Lusitania and U-20, the book Dead Wake is incredible, and I would highly recommend it. U-20 was a war submarine built and used by the Germans during the First World War. Now, U-20 was active not long after World War I began. However, we're not going to start U-20's story at that point. We're going to start U-20's story a little bit after World War I started. The date we're going to start telling U-20's story is December of 1914. The reason we're going to start telling U-20's story at that point is because on that date, U-20 got a new captain. His name was Captain Walter Schwieger, and the reason why he is so important to this story is because he was the one who was in command of U-20 on that fateful day that it encountered the Lusitania. Now, these submarines were known by a different name during the First World War. You see, these submarines were referred to as U-boats, and the reason that Germany started using these U-boats in the first place was in response to something that the British did to Germany not long after World War I broke out. You see, in the early months of the war, the British erected a massive naval blockade surrounding Germany's seaports, and the reason they did this was to try to severely limit Germany's ability to trade with other nations, and the British were hoping that this would eventually starve Germany into submission. Now, in response to this, the Germans decided to unleash a massive U-boat fleet and send them to the Atlantic, and then they were going to try to do the same thing in the Atlantic that the British were doing around the German seaports. So, basically what this means is the Germans tried to have a submarine blockade right in front of the UK, and then they were going to try to intercept and sink any ships that were trying to bring supplies to the UK during this time of war. 
Now, due to range limitations on U-boats at this time period, these subs didn't travel that far out into the Atlantic. They instead positioned themselves not that far off the UK coastline so they could intercept ships as they were heading to port. Now, in this map, you see an overhead view of the UK. You can see Ireland, England, and all that. You'll notice on the outer edges of the map, you'll see a light blue water, and then closer towards the UK, you'll notice a dark blue water surrounding the country. This area that's marked in the dark blue, this is the area at which the U-boats operated, and this is where they laid in wait while ships sailed in, and then once the ships crossed the border of their territory, these U-boats would try to torpedo and sink them. Now, the fact that the British set up this naval blockade around Germany's seaports, as you can imagine, really didn't sit that well with the German military. Because what you have to remember is, is that while it is true that this blockade was limiting Germany's ability to get supplies from other nations, it was also hurting the average citizen who lived in Germany during this time period from buying food and other supplies. You know, they couldn't get stuff as well due to this blockade. So, as you can imagine, there were certain members of the German military who were really out for blood because of this blockade, you know? They were like, okay, the British are going to do this to us, well, I'm going to do everything I can to hurt them. So, this would cause some U-boat captains to ignore cruiser rules, and if they saw any type of enemy ship, whether it be civilian, military, or whatever, they would go after it and try to torpedo it. This is exactly what Walter Schwieger did on U-20 because not long after he took command of the submarine, he literally went out and sunk the first three ships he saw, and these were small civilian merchant ships. He saw them, and he torpedoed them. U-20, under the command of Walter Schwieger, quickly got a reputation for being one of the most ruthless submarines out in the Atlantic during the First World War. Then, around a month later, U-20 spotted another ship approaching the submarine. Schwieger dived the sub and prepared to torpedo it. Upon closer inspection, Figur realized that this vessel was painted white and it had red crosses painted on its hull. This identified the vessel as a hospital ship. Figur didn't care. He took U-20, got it into position, and fired a torpedo at the ship. Luckily, U-20 missed, and the vessel was able to escape U-20 without getting torpedoed or sunk. Now, the fact that U-20 tried to torpedo a hospital ship really didn't sit that well with the rest of the world. I mean, it made pretty big news that U-20 attempted to sink a hospital ship. Under the cruiser rules, you know, a hospital ship, you don't target it, you know, because it's not being used for military purposes. It's trying to transport innocent people, you know. You don't target a hospital ship under any circumstances. So the fact that Sphiger would try to torpedo it, well, it didn't make Germany look too good. And honestly, even Sveger's superiors were surprised at how ruthless Sveger was when it came to torpedoing ships. But as far as the rest of the world was concerned, the fact that U-20 did try to torpedo a hospital ship, well, it really killed any sympathy that Germany had with the outside world due to how ruthless some of these U-boats were operating. Now, even though Sveger was pretty ruthless in how he fought his enemy, among the members of his crew, Sveger was considered to be a good captain, and he also was considered to have a good sense of humor. Sveger even traveled with his own pet dog on board the U-boat. Now, a little bit later in the war, the fact that Sveger had his dog on board the submarine would put U-20 in a very interesting situation. I'll tell you that story right now. Later in the war, U-20 encountered a French ship. This ship was known as the Maria de Milenos, and I apologize if I didn't say that right. But now, this attack on this ship was done in accordance with cruiser rules. Sveger approached the ship, and then when he tried to get the ship to stop, the ship initially ran. However, Sveger fired a couple of shots at it with U-20's deck gun, and this got the ship to stop. Sveger waited for the crew of this ship to evacuate, and once the lifeboats were launched, Sveger continued to fire his gun into the ship's hull. He didn't want to waste a U-boat torpedo on a ship that was stopped and just sitting there. After this vessel went down, Sveger's crew was surveying the area at which the ship sank, and they noticed a box floating towards U-20. Inside of this box, they noticed a dog was in there. A dog had survived the sinking of the ship and was now floating inside of this box that was drifting towards U-20. So U-20's crew picked up the dog and brought her aboard the submarine. Now, what you have to remember is, this dog that they rescued was female. Sveger's dog was male, and in short order, the dog became pregnant. U-20 ended up having four puppies 
born on board this submarine. Now, Speaker realized that having six dogs on one U-boat wasn't ideal, so he arranged to have a few other U-boats approach U-20, and he gave three of the four puppies to other U-boat captains. Speaker later commented that one night while he went to sleep on the U-boat, he went to sleep with his pet dog beside him and a puppy, and then right beside him was also a torpedo. The next story of note for U-20 occurred while the vessel was on patrol. While out at sea, Schwieger was looking through the U-20's periscope when he noticed that there were a few buoys floating in the water ahead of the submarine. Now, upon first glance, these buoys didn't seem to serve any purpose. However, Schwieger didn't see any danger, so he had U-20 continue forward. U-20 ended up passing in between these two buoys, and then, right after it happened, Schwieger heard a very unsettling sound coming from U-20's hull. Sveger said that this sound sounded like metal grinding up against metal, and he wasn't sure what was going on at first. And then he noticed that U-20's speed began to rapidly drop, and then he also noticed that the sub was slipping deeper and deeper into the water. At the time that U-20 encountered this thing, U-20 was at a depth of roughly 40 feet, and then within about 30 seconds, the sub was at 60, then 70 feet, and dropping fast. Then, Speaker realized what had just happened. Those two buoys that I mentioned earlier, well, they were holding up a giant steel anti-submarine net, and U-20 sailed right into it. And the purpose of these nets was to drag a submarine down to the bottom, where the sub would eventually be trapped, and the crew would eventually die when the sub couldn't ascend up to the surface anymore. Now, U-20 slammed into the seafloor not long after it hit this net. However, the ocean was only around 100 feet deep in that area, so it's not like the pressure could crush this up. Once U-20 came to rest, the crew began to try to figure out what they were going to do to free U-20. And then, everybody in the sub heard a weird sound above them. A British destroyer had seen U-20 hit the net and was circling the area directly above U-20, waiting to see what would happen. Now, after a little bit of time, Speaker ordered U-20's engines to be thrown into reverse. And believe it or not, the sub was able to work its way out of the submarine net. Now, after this happened, Speaker ordered the sub to move ahead slow while they tried to lose this British destroyer that was up on the surface. However, something strange happened after that. Every time U-20 changed course underwater, the destroyer up on the surface matched its course. Now, what you have to remember is, this is pre-sonar and pre-depth charges. This ship had no way to attack U-20 while it was underwater, and this ship also had no way to track U-20 beneath the surface. So the question was, how was this ship following U-20? Speaker had no idea. Then, after the sun went down, they finally lost the ship. After this happened, U-20 came up to the surface, and Speaker saw what had happened and he quickly realized how this ship had been following U-20. Turns out, a tiny bit of the net was still caught on U-20's hull. So that means that as U-20 was sailing along the seafloor, they were literally dragging the buoys that were holding that net up in the first place with the sub. So all this destroyer had to do was follow the buoy as it was floating along the surface, and this ship knew exactly where U-20 was. It wasn't until the cover of darkness, when this ship could no longer see the buoys, that U-20 finally lost the destroyer. Our next story with U-20 occurred on May 6, 1915. On this day, U-20 was operating off the southern coast of Ireland. And on this particular day, U-20 encountered three ships and managed to sink two of them. Now, after this happened, Speaker was faced with a difficult decision. By this point in his patrol, U-20 was beginning to run low on both fuel and torpedoes. Now, Speaker needed to keep a few torpedoes for the journey home, but he figured that he could spare one more torpedo for one more attack. Now, Speaker had also been told by Wireless that the Lusitania was going to be sailing into the area that U-20 was operating in within the next day or so. So, Speaker decided to have U-20 stay in the area for one more day to see if they could spot the Lusitania. On the morning of May 7, 1915, Captain Speaker and the crew of U-20 were doing everything they could to try to spot the Lusitania before U-20 had to leave the area. While they were doing this, they spotted a military cruiser approaching U-20's position. This ship was known as the HMS Juno. Now, Speaker dived U-20 and tried to get it into position to be able to torpedo this ship. However, the vessel was moving too fast, and the course of the Juno would make it 
it make it a very difficult target for U-20 to hit. So Sphere decided to not launch the torpedo unless he could get U-20 into a better position. However, that never happened. The Juno sailed right past U-20 and kept on going. Sphiger tried to follow the Juno, however, the course of the Juno and the speed of the Juno was way too fast for U-20 to keep up. After the Juno went out of range of U-20, Sphiger surfaced the sub and got very frustrated. Since he didn't think he was going to be able to find the Lusitania and the Juno had just escaped him, he began to try to plot a new course home. However, as he was doing this, his crew was still up on top of the submarine, looking around with binoculars to try to spot any other ship. And then, just before U-20 left the area, another vessel appeared on the horizon. It is the early afternoon on May the 7th, 1915, and the RMS Lusitania is getting ready to complete another transatlantic voyage. The ship had been traveling for roughly a week at this point, from New York City all the way across the Atlantic towards the city of Liverpool. Now, at this current time, the Lusitania was approaching the southern coast of Ireland. The ship was going to travel to roughly a mile or two off of Ireland's southern coastline, then it was going to ride in parallel with Ireland's southern coastline. Then, once it passed Ireland, it would then turn north and head into the St. George's Channel and into the Irish Sea, and then at that point the ship could then steam into Liverpool Harbor. However, what everybody on board the Lusitania did not yet know was that as the Lusitania was approaching Ireland's southern coastline, the ship was being watched by German U-boat U-20, and at this current time, the submarine was going to try to get into position to attack the Lusitania. Once Captain Speaker and his crew on German U-boat U-20 spotted the Lusitania steaming towards their general location, the crew immediately dived U-20 and tried to get it into position to torpedo the Lusitania. Now, it didn't take the crew of U-20 very long to identify the Lusitania. This ship, especially with its four smokestacks sticking out, made this vessel one of the most recognizable in the Atlantic, so they knew what ship they were attacking. But the other thing you have to realize is, is that in terms of speed, U-20 was no match for the Lusitania. If this ship suddenly changed course, or if this ship spotted U-20 and then tried to flee, U-20 would have no hope of attacking the Lusitania. Their only hope to pull off a successful attack on the Lusitania was to get somewhere in front of the ship and then torpedo it as the ship sailed by. Now, as the Lusitania was approaching U-20's position, at this current time, U-20 was located somewhere around 15 miles or so off of Ireland's southern coast. The ship continued to approach U-20's position, and then when the ship got within two miles or so of where U-20 was positioned, the ship changed course and began to head closer towards the southern coast of Ireland. Upon seeing this, Captain Sveger on U-20 got incredibly frustrated. He knew that if the ship was on this current course and stayed on this course, then they would have no hope of attacking the Lusitania. Still, Sveger kept U-20 under the surface and continued to watch the ship through U-20's periscope. Then, just as he was losing all hope that he would be able to attack the Lusitania, something happened with the ship that he could not believe. Now, it's important to note that the reason the Lusitania changed course had nothing to do with U-20. At being more than two miles away from U-20, it would have been extremely difficult for the lookouts on the Lusitania to spot U-20's periscope. The reason the Lusitania changed course was because as it got closer to the southern coast of Ireland, the ship simply changed course and was going to try to head closer to Ireland's southern coastline as it had done many times before. However, at the exact same time that U-20 saw the Lusitania beginning to steam away from their general location, Captain Turner on board the Lusitania was dealing with a situation, a situation that, at least at first, he wasn't sure how to handle. You see, earlier that morning, the Lusitania had encountered a very thick fog, and this fog was so severe that they couldn't see anything that was in front of the Lusitania. So Captain Turner decided to slow the Lusitania down to a speed of 15 knots until they successfully got out of the fog. And around 12 p.m., 1 p.m. on the same day, the fog was finally starting to let up. However, this fog had greatly slowed down the Lusitania's progress and it was running behind schedule. And to make matters worse, this fog left them without knowing an exact position as to where the Lusitania was along the Irish coastline. So they were trying to figure that out. Now, to make matters worse, 
During that same morning, the Lusitania received a few wireless communications from the British Admiralty warning the ship that there were U-boats in the area. However, the problem with this warning was, was that it wasn't very specific in terms of where the U-boats were. All that Captain Turner knew was that there were U-boats behind the Lusitania and supposedly in front of the Lusitania, but he didn't know exactly where. So honestly, there was nothing he could really do about that and he was extremely frustrated. Now, as the ship continued to sail along, Eventually, they were able to see the southern coast of Ireland off the Lusitania's port side, and they were able to get a fix on the ship's general location. However, due to the fog and the slow speed that the ship had to travel through, they now had another problem. You see, in order for the Lusitania to dock in Liverpool, the ship has to enter the Mercy River. But the problem is, the ship could only enter the Mercy River at high tide, because directly in front of the Mercy River was a sandbar known as the Mercy Bar, and the only time that the water in that area was deep enough for the Lusitania was high tide. If the ship arrived at low tide, then the ship would have to wait out in the Irish Sea for high tide to come in, and then the ship could proceed through. But obviously, with U-boats being a constant threat, this would be extremely dangerous for the Lusitania. So, while Captain Turner tried to figure out what to do, he had the ship continue its current course, steaming towards the Irish coastline. Now, it didn't take him very long to figure out a plan. What he and his crew decided to do was slow the Lusitania down from its current speed of 21 knots all the way down to 18 knots. And then, instead of having the Lusitania continue to steam towards the Irish coastline, remember how I said earlier in this video that the ship usually maintained a distance of 1-2 to two miles from the Irish coast as it was steaming towards Liverpool? Well, what they decided to do was have the ship maintain its current distance from the Irish coast, a distance of roughly 15 miles, and then just travel at 18 knots. By doing this, the, the ship would arrive in Liverpool early the next morning, at a time when high tide was in effect, so the ship could travel into the Mercy River without stopping. However, when Captain Turner made this decision, he ordered the Lusitania's helmsman to turn the ship hard to starboard. And when he did this, he didn't know it at the time, but he had just changed the Lusitania's course and laid in a heading that would take it directly in front of German U-boat U-20. Back on U-20, Captain Svieger could not get over what he was looking at. One minute, he sees the Lusitania steaming further and further away from U-20, and then a minute later, he sees the ship change course and begin heading directly towards U-20. Captain Svieger later said that it was nothing short of a miracle that they were able to torpedo the Lusitania in such a way. They couldn't have gotten a better shot on the Lusitania after this course change, even if the ship wanted to be torpedoed. That's how close the Lusitania came to U-20 after it made this starboard turn. Anyway, as the Lusitania continued to steam closer and closer to U-20, Captain Sveger ordered one torpedo to be armed, and he ordered the bow torpedo tube flooded. Once this was done, the crew of U-20 sat back and waited as the Lusitania continued to steam closer and closer to U-20. It is now 2.09 p.m. on board the RMS Lusitania. The weather outside is now perfect. There isn't a trace of a fog left to be seen on the horizon. The passengers have begun to work their way out onto the Lusitania's boat deck to enjoy the beautiful weather. Many of the passengers have also noticed the Irish coastline off of the Lusitania's port side and are excited about the prospect of arriving in Liverpool. However, on the Lusitania's starboard side bridge wing, a crewman is keeping a sharp eye out on the horizon, keeping an eye out for any signs that would show that a U-boat is in the area. Then, at 2.10 p.m., something unexpected caught his eye. Did you guys see what I was talking about in that last video clip? If you missed it, after this video is over, go back and take a look at that clip of the crewman looking off the Lusitania's starboard side and take a close look at the sea. In the last few seconds of that clip, you may notice something different about the water. If you find it, let me know what you found in the comments below. Back on board German U-boat U-20, it is currently 2.09 p.m., and the crew are anxiously watching the Lusitania get closer and closer to U-20. Then, at 2.10 p.m., the Lusitania is in range of U-20, and Captain Svieger orders U-20 to fire. U-20 fires one torpedo at the Lusitania. When the torpedo left U-20's torpedo tube, it sent a plume of air bubbles up to the surface. It was this plume of air bubbles that the crewman, who was standing on the starboard side of the Lusitania's bridge wing, noticed at 2.10 p.m. Now, the crewman that was on board the Lusitania who first spotted the torpedo leaving U-20, as soon as he realized what he was looking at, he screamed at the top of his voice, TORPEDO CLOSING OFF THE STARBOARD BOW! And once he yelled that, the entire ship went into a panic almost instantly. 
people were flocking every which way and those passengers that were on the Lusitania's starboard side, well, they rushed to the railing to try to see if they could spot the torpedo. And because the weather around the ship was so beautiful and the sea was so calm, everybody who was on the Lusitania's starboard side said they had a clear view of the torpedo racing through the water heading straight towards the Lusitania. Now, I did some research to try to figure out what the crew tried to do with the Lusitania to avoid this torpedo impact. Like, did they try to turn the ship to port or starboard? You know, just try to do something to avoid an impact. But based on what I could find, it doesn't seem like they did anything. It doesn't seem like they tried to turn the ship either way. And if I'm wrong about this, please correct me in the comments below. But honestly, if I think about this logically, Based on the position that U-20 was, relative to the position that the Lusitania was at the time that U-20 fired its torpedo at the ship, well, you see, these torpedoes can travel at a speed of roughly 40 miles per hour. And based on everything, the captain of U-20 thought that it would only take the torpedo roughly 30 seconds to reach the Lusitania right after it was fired. So with such a little window of time, I'm not really sure if anybody on the Lusitania could react at all. You know, by the time you spot the torpedo, by the time you rush to the ship's helm and try to turn the vessel, I mean, honestly, you've already lost your window of time there. So based on what I could find, it seems like that there was nothing the crew could do to try to turn the Lusitania and avoid an impact with this torpedo. Once the torpedo was spotted, the only thing that the crew of the Lusitania could do was just hope that the damage wouldn't be too severe. Now, during the time of the First World War, the way these torpedoes propelled themselves through the sea was by using an engine that was powered by compressed air. So basically what happened was, a U-boat would fire a torpedo, this compressed air would go into the torpedo's engine and spin the propeller. And then after this air was used, the torpedo would send the air bubbles from the compressed air up to the surface. So that means that if you were on a ship and you saw one of these torpedoes heading towards your vessel, then directly behind the torpedo, you would see a straight line going through the sea right behind the torpedo that was basically these compressed air bubbles leaving the torpedo. Now, over time, this trail of air bubbles that followed a torpedo in its wake got a slang term. This term was called a dead wake, since it was probably the last wake you would ever see. Then, just before 2.11 p.m., on the afternoon of May the 7th, 1915, the torpedo fired by U-20 struck the Lusitania. The torpedo hit the Lusitania on the starboard side in between the first and second funnel, and the explosion was felt all throughout the ship. Now, immediately following the torpedo detonation, the crew on board the Lusitania was going to try to figure out and assess the damage that the Lusitania received by this torpedo. However, in the seconds following the torpedo detonation, the crew did not yet realize it, but the damage to the Lusitania by this torpedo was worse than they could possibly imagine. It is Friday, May 7th, 1915, on board the RMS Lusitania. At exactly 2.10 p.m., a torpedo struck the Lusitania on the starboard side in between the first and second funnel. At the exact moment of impact, 350 pounds worth of explosives located within the torpedo detonated instantly. The resulting explosion exceeded temperatures of 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly 5,000 degrees Celsius. Now, when you factor in the high temperatures of this explosion, and you also factor in the pressure put on the Lusitania's hull at the site where this torpedo hit the ship, well, the Lusitania's hull was little more than tissue paper against these forces. The resulting explosion immediately breached two or more of the Lusitania's 12 watertight compartments, immediately allowing tons of seawater to begin flooding into the Lusitania's hull. Now, just to give you all a better idea into how massive of a hole this torpedo left in the Lusitania's hull below the waterline actually was, well, some estimates think that this hole was roughly the size of a small house. Imagine how much seawater could get into a ship through a hole that big below the waterline. Now, even though most of the damage to the Lusitania was below the waterline, there was some small amounts of damage caused to the Lusitania's upper decks as a result of this torpedo impact as well. You see, at the exact moment that this torpedo struck the Lusitania's hull, it sent a massive geyser of water shooting up higher up than the ship itself. And located within this geyser was all kinds of small bits of debris caused by this torpedo detonation. So you had bits of rope, bits of metal, you know, parts of the torpedo itself, you know, all the stuff that got blasted off of the ship and the torpedo was sent up into the air with this geyser. 
Now, because the Lusitania was traveling at roughly 18 knots at the exact moment the torpedo went off, this caused a lot of this debris to rain all around the ship as the Lusitania continued forward through this geyser. And another thing that happened was lifeboat number five on the Lusitania starboard side, well, this lifeboat was stored on the deck directly above the point that the torpedo detonated. And the resulting detonation basically blasted this lifeboat to atoms. There wasn't a trace of it left on the ship after the torpedo went off. Now the damage to the Lusitania's hull below the waterline went way further than just this giant hole that we discussed earlier. A lot of the rivets that were located near the site where this torpedo detonated broke loose, which allowed even more water to flood even more spaces of the Lusitania's interior area. And the porthole windows located near the site of detonation, well, all of these porthole windows and the glass within them, well, this glass shattered, which means that once the Lusitania sank so low that these porthole windows went underwater, the water would have even more means to access the ship's interior. Now, in the interior spaces of the ship, well, the damage down below the waterline in these areas was pretty extensive as well. Many of the Lusitania's watertight compartments were damaged by the force of the explosion, and many of the watertight doors located in these compartments were dislodged, which means they couldn't close them properly. So these compartments were no longer watertight. Now, even though we discussed earlier in this video that it's most likely that two watertight compartments were directly opened up to the sea by this giant hole in the ship's hull caused by a torpedo impact, I would say that when you factor in all these other variables, I'd say at least three watertight compartments were opened up to the sea when this torpedo struck the Lusitania's hull. Now immediately following the torpedo impact, the ship began to take on a very sharp list to starboard. This list happened so quickly that the crew of the Lusitania really didn't have any time to react to it at all. They were still trying to recover from what had just happened with the torpedo, and now immediately following that the ship starts listing. But within 10 seconds of the torpedo striking the Lusitania's hull, the Lusitania started leaning to her starboard side. The ship stabilized with a list of 15 degrees to starboard. That right there should tell you how much water was now flooding inside of the Lusitania, immediately following the torpedo detonation. Now the reason why the Lusitania took this sharp list to starboard so soon after the torpedo detonation was because of the Lusitania's longitudinal bulkheads. And in case you don't remember what a longitudinal bulkhead is, I'll explain. You see, the interior spaces of the Lusitania were separated by 12 individual watertight compartments. And of these 12 watertight compartments, any two could be breached and the ship would not sink. But when they were building the Lusitania, they decided to add another safety feature to the ship. And what these safety features were called were longitudinal bulkheads, which means that there were additional watertight bulkheads placed along the inner hull of the Lusitania. And what they also decided to do with these bulkheads built along the inner hall was use them as coal bunkers. So what ended up happening was when the torpedo struck the Lusitania on the starboard side and damaged those longitudinal bulkheads, even though these bulkheads weren't watertight anymore, when the torpedo hit it, the water still filled up these bulkheads first before it spilled into the rest of the interior spaces of the ship. But as that water rapidly flooded those longitudinal bulkheads along the ship's starboard side, the weight of the water in those bulkheads dragged the ship over to her starboard side. This is why the Lusitania developed such a sharp list to starboard so soon after the torpedo detonation. And if you thought things couldn't get any worse for the Lusitania so soon after the torpedo detonation, remember it's only been 10 seconds ship time since the torpedo went off, well guess what? They could. You see, as the Lusitania took on this very sharp list to starboard, a good number of the porthole windows on the Lusitania's starboard side went underwater almost instantly. And the reason why this was such a big problem for the ship was because it was such a nice day outside and a good number of the Lusitania's passengers had opened up the porthole windows in their staterooms before leaving their cabins for the day. And what you need to remember is every single porthole window that was left open on the ship, well as soon as it dipped beneath the surface, each window could let in an estimated three tons of seawater per minute. Now I'm not sure how accurate this is, but some estimates believe that there could have been as many as 70 open porthole windows on the ship's starboard side that went underwater almost instantly following the torpedo detonation. So when you factor in that many windows open, and then you times that by three tons of seawater per minute, just think about how much water was flooding the Lusitania's interior so soon after the torpedo detonation. So needless to say, the Lusitania very quickly hit the maximum amount of flooding the ship could take within her interior and not sink, and quickly surpassed it. So 
In less than a minute following the torpedo detonation, the Lusitania exceeded her maximum flooding limit, and there was nothing that Captain Turner or anybody on the ship could do to keep the ship from sinking. At the time of the torpedo detonation, Captain Turner wasn't on the bridge. He was actually heading to his stateroom at that time to retrieve something in his cabin. He was standing just outside his stateroom door when the torpedo exploded against the Lusitania's hull. As soon as he felt the explosion, he immediately turned around and began heading for the bridge. He was actually climbing up a flight of stairs when the Lusitania took this very sharp list to starboard. And the process of the ship rolling over to her starboard side was so sudden and quick that Captain Turner basically had to brace himself in this stairway to keep himself from falling. Once the ship stabilized with its 15 degree list to starboard, Captain Turner began to head to the bridge once again. And then as he was proceeding towards the bridge, something else happened to the ship that Captain Turner could not believe. Around 15 seconds after the torpedo had struck the Lusitania's hull, Captain Turner was still racing to the bridge when the unthinkable happened. Captain Turner said that he heard and felt a second massive explosion echo throughout the ship. Now the funny thing about this explosion was, there was nothing visible on the outside of the Lusitania to signal where this explosion came from, which could only mean one thing, that something inside the Lusitania had just exploded. The source of this secondary explosion is a highly debated topic even to this day. Many people believed for a very long time, and I count myself among them, that they thought that it was the small arms munitions that the Lusitania was carrying in her cargo hold that exploded. However, they did many dives to the wreck of the Lusitania to try to figure out what the cause of this secondary explosion was, and they discovered that the cargo hold where these munitions were kept was completely intact, so it was not the small arms munitions that exploded. So with this evidence in mind, and with everything that I have been researching over the past couple of weeks, I tend to lean more towards that it was probably a steam line or a boiler explosion that caused this massive secondary explosion. And the reason I think this was because not long after the Lusitania experienced this secondary explosion, the ship lost nearly all steam pressure in her engines. And if it was a steam line or a boiler explosion that caused the secondary explosion, then this makes sense. You know, the ship would lose almost all of its steam pressure if something like that exploded. But I'll get more into that in a few minutes. But yeah, for now, that is my theory on what caused the secondary explosion. But we will never be able to say with absolute certainty what caused this secondary explosion. Captain Turner entered the Lusitania's bridge shortly after this second massive explosion was heard and felt all throughout the ship. Upon entering the bridge, Captain Turner's first order was to try to stop the ship as quickly as possible. He wanted to do this by throwing the Lusitania's engines into reverse, because by doing it this way, he would be able to stop the ship much more quickly than if he simply just shut off the Lusitania's engines and let the Lusitania coast to a stop. Now, the engine room did receive Captain Turner's order to throw the Lusitania's engines into reverse. However, when they received this order, they sent word back to the bridge that steam pressure within the Lusitania's engines had dropped from 195 PSI down to only 50 PSI. And with such a low amount of pressure in the system, the Lusitania's engines did not respond. The Lusitania's engines were now dead, so that means that the only way that Captain Turner had to stop the ship was to slowly but surely let her drift to a halt. Now, the issue of not being able to stop the Lusitania presented two real problems to Captain Turner. Number one, he could not launch any of the Lusitania's lifeboats until the vessel had slowed down quite a bit. And the reason being was, if you tried to launch a lifeboat while a vessel like the Lusitania is still moving forward at 18 knots, well, the second this lifeboat touches the water, the forward momentum of the ship could rip the lifeboat apart, or at the very least, it would spill all the occupants in that lifeboat into the sea. So he had to wait until the Lusitania stopped before he could attempt to launch the lifeboats, or at the very least, wait for the ship to slow down a bit. Now, he could go ahead and start the preparation process for the boats. He just couldn't lower them at this time. And the second issue that Captain Turner had to deal with due to the Lusitania's forward momentum was with the ship moving forward at this time, well, it put a lot more water pressure on the damaged sections of the Lusitania that were now below the waterline. They use a term called forced flooding to describe this effect. You know, if there's a damaged compartment below the waterline, then the increased pressure on that area due to the forward momentum of the ship would force more water into a vessel's hull than if the vessel was sitting still in the water. There are some estimates that believe that due to the Lusitania's forward momentum of 18 knots at this time, that 
as much as 100 tons of seawater was entering the Lusitania through its damaged compartments below the waterline. So, as you can see, the Lusitania was taking on water fast, and Captain Turner was in an incredibly desperate situation. When Captain Turner realized that he wasn't going to be able to stop the Lusitania, what he decided to do next was to attempt to steer the Lusitania towards the Irish shoreline. His hope was that if he couldn't stop the ship, he may be able to beach the ship on Ireland's coastline. He ordered the helmsman to turn the Lusitania to port, the helmsman did this, and the ship responded. He waited until the Lusitania's bow was evenly lined up with Ireland's shoreline, then he told the helmsman to even the ship out and keep the Lusitania pointed at a lighthouse at the old head of Kinsale, which was a location directly in front of the Lusitania on Ireland's coastline. However, when the helmsman attempted to even the ship out, the Lusitania did not respond. At this time, the Lusitania's helm was now dead. All Captain Turner and the bridge crew could do was watch helplessly as the Lusitania's bow slowly turned away from Ireland and the ship began once again to head further out to sea. It has now been two minutes since torpedo detonation. Upon realizing the helm of the Lusitania was dead, Captain Turner realized that his ship was in serious trouble. At this time, he ordered a call for help to be sent out, and he also ordered to have all the Lusitania's watertight doors closed. A good number of the watertight doors on the Lusitania were automatic. They could simply close these doors by throwing some switches on the bridge. And he also ordered to have the lifeboats of the Lusitania prepped, but he also told the crew to not launch the lifeboats yet because the ship was moving too fast to launch the boats. Just get them ready to be launched. That's all he told them to do. Now, given how much everything had already gone wrong with the Lusitania so soon after the torpedo impact, Captain Turner was concerned that the watertight doors, or the automatic ones anyway, wouldn't be able to close properly. So he ordered one member of his bridge crew to go down below and check to make sure that the watertight doors were closed. This crewman never returned. It has been three minutes since torpedo detonation, and most of the passengers and crew on board the Lusitania now know that their ship is in serious trouble. Inside the Lusitania, people are running every which way to try to make their way up to the upper decks. Now, most of the people inside the Lusitania decide to use the ship's stairways in order to make their way up to the boat deck. However, not all do this. A good number of the people inside the Lusitania choose to try to make their way up to the boat deck by taking the Lusitania's elevator system. However, what the people who took the elevators inside the Lusitania don't yet realize is that another one of the Lusitania's critical systems is about to fail. Just four minutes after the Lusitania was struck by the torpedo, there was no longer enough steam pressure within the Lusitania's systems to power the Lusitania's dynamos. And as a result of this, all of the Lusitania's electricity now failed, and the ship was plunged into total darkness. Now what you have to remember is, despite the fact that it's the middle of the afternoon as the Lusitania is currently sinking, if you were in an area of the ship that didn't have any windows or portholes or anything like that, while well, these parts of the ship, when the power failed, were plunged into total darkness. So can you imagine trying to escape the interior of the Lusitania in pitch black? I mean, you couldn't see anything. I mean, I can't even imagine how terrifying this must have been. But if you think that was terrifying, well, for the passengers who were trying to escape the Lusitania by taking the ship's elevators up to the boat deck, well, they faced a whole other kind of horror. You see, there was one elevator on the Lusitania that was on its way up to the boat deck when the power failed, and when the power went out, this elevator became trapped in between floors, and the people within this elevator, they were stuck. There was nothing they could do. People who escaped the Lusitania said that they could hear screaming coming from inside the walls as the people who were in this elevator tried desperately to get out. But unfortunately, nothing could be done for these people trapped in the elevator. The Lusitania was sinking way too fast. Now, despite the fact that the Lusitania's power had by this point completely failed, the ship was still able to send out a distress call by means of the Marconi Wireless's emergency battery backup system. Now, by this point, a good number of ships had picked up the Lusitania's distress call and were beginning to head towards the ship. The distress call of the Lusitania was also picked up in Ireland, and Ireland's government was already beginning to send a distress call over to England and to the British Admiralty's base in London. So, slowly but surely, the entire world was starting to realize that something very serious had just happened with the RMS Lusitania. Right around the time that all of the Lusitania's power went out, there were already a good number of passengers up on the Lusitania's boat deck waiting to be put into one of the ship's lifeboats. 
Now the first boat that looked like it was about to be launched was lifeboat number two, which was the first boat on the Lusitania's port side boat deck, right beside the bridge. There were a good number of passengers already climbing into this boat and they were wanting to be lowered away. However, what these people didn't realize was that a great tragedy was about to happen at lifeboat number two. Now before I tell you about the horrible tragedy that unfolded at lifeboat number two on the Lusitania, I first need to give you a little bit of a lesson in how these lifeboats are prepped and launched. Because if I don't tell you all this, you won't fully understand why what happened at lifeboat number two happened at all. You see, if a ship like the Lusitania isn't sinking, and the lifeboats are just simply secured on the ship's deck, they use a series of chains to hold the lifeboat on the deck, so if the ship encounters rough seas and all that and is rocking around, these lifeboats don't slide all over the place. So if they want to launch some lifeboats, the first thing they have to do is break these chains free. And then at this point, the lifeboat is just sitting on the deck through the power of gravity. You know, it's just resting there. And this lifeboat could slide around if the situation allowed it to. And then once these chains are free, the crew then use ropes that are secured to the Lusitania's davits, and then they hoist the lifeboat up, and they pull it out over the side, and then lower it over the ship's side using the davits and the ropes and so on and so forth. Now, with the Lusitania, remember, the ship is currently listing pretty heavily to starboard. And at lifeboat number two, there are passengers there panicking and climbing into the boat and all that stuff. Now, the officer in charge of lowering lifeboat number two was trying to keep order at this location. And he was trying to tell all the passengers, hey, we can't lower this lifeboat because number one, the ship is still moving way too fast. And number two, the ship is listing too far to, to the starboard side. So if we free this lifeboat, we're not gonna be able to get the lifeboat over the side of the ship. It's just gonna slide back down onto the deck if it's freed. And right as he was saying this to these passengers, he heard the sound of a hammer hit a chain. And in order to break these chains free and have the boat sit naturally on its own, you have to hammer down on a release pin and this would break the chain. He heard, this officer, he heard a crewman whacking the release chain and he knew in his head what was about to happen. This officer turned and looked at the crewman and he said he literally saw the hammer in the guy's hand up in the air about to hit the chain. And before the word no could leave this officer's lips, he hit the chain and the chain snapped free. As soon as this happened, because the Lusitania is very heavy list to starboard, this lifeboat slid free, came crashing down onto the deck, and crushed several people against the Lusitania superstructure. And then, because by this point the Lusitania was down pretty far at the head as well, the lifeboat began to slide forward, injuring and killing countless more people as it headed for the bridge. Now the lifeboat eventually came to rest, right underneath the port side bridge wing, right around here where my finger is. And Captain Turner was on the port side bridge wing when this went down, and he saw everything happen. I mean, I can't even put into words how disastrous this was. I mean, remember, this was the first lifeboat that was about to be prepped. And honestly, it was a, it was a bad omen for the things that were about to happen on board the Lusitania. It has been roughly five minutes since the RMS Lusitania was torpedoed by German U-boat U-20 off of Ireland's southern coastline and started to sink. On the Lusitania's bridge, Captain Turner is waiting desperately for the ship to slow down enough so he can begin to launch the Lusitania's lifeboats. On the Lusitania's boat deck, the crew is working as fast as they can to prep all of the lifeboats because what the crew want to do is as soon as they get the all clear from the captain, they want to go ahead and have all of these lifeboats prepped filled up with passengers, and ready to be launched as quick as possible. However, this was easier said than done for the crew working on the Lusitania's boat deck. One reason for this was because the ship was listing very heavily to starboard, so it was making it very difficult for them to prep the lifeboats. And the second reason that this was such a challenge for the crew on the Lusitania's deck is, believe it or not, the crew was short-handed. A good number of the crew members on the Lusitania that were trained in prepping the lifeboats were not on the boat deck. Now, in case you're wondering where they were at the time of the sinking, well, the truth of this is absolutely terrifying. So the reason the Lusitania's crew, at least those on the boat deck, were shorthanded during the sinking was because a good number of the ship's crew were working in the Lusitania's cargo hold at the time of the torpedo detonation. And the reason they were in the Lusitania's cargo hold, which was located in the bow part of the ship, was because where the ship was due to arrive in Liverpool the next day, the crew were down there prepping all the passengers' luggage. That way they would have an easier time unloading it the next day when the ship docked in Liverpool. 
and the only way in and out of the Lusitania's cargo hold was by means of an electric elevator. So, when the power went out, all of the crew members that were down there, they were trapped in the Lusitania's cargo hold. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how terrifying that must have been for them. And remember, like, there was no emergency stairway or nothing. When the power went out and that elevator stalled, those crew members were stuck. And unfortunately, none of them made it out. They were trapped in the cargo hold until the water reached them. Now, at some point between five and six minutes following the torpedo detonation, Captain Turner told his crew that they could begin launching the Lusitania's lifeboats. He told his crew that the ship had slowed down enough for them to be able to successfully lower the boats away, despite the fact that the ship was still moving forward at a pretty high rate of speed at that time. So, if the ship was still moving quickly, why would he have ordered his crew to go ahead and launch the Lusitania's lifeboats, even though he surely knew the risks of launching the boats while the ship was still moving forward at a high rate of speed? Well, I honestly believe it was because from the Lusitania's bridge, Captain Turner could clearly see how fast the Lusitania was sinking. And I'm sure he was thinking that if they did not at least attempt to launch the lifeboats now, then there was a very good chance that the Lusitania would sink before any lifeboats made it off the ship. Now, when Captain Turner told his crew that they could begin launching the Lusitania's lifeboats, he also made a point to tell them to only focus on launching the Lusitania's lifeboats from the ship's starboard side. He told them to not even bother with the lifeboats on the Lusitania's port side. And the reason he told them this was due to the Lusitania's very sharp list to starboard. So, when a ship is listing, this can cause one whole side of the ship's lifeboats to be basically unusable. So, in the case of the Lusitania, where it was leaning very heavily to starboard, this means that the starboard side lifeboats were leaning out away from the ship because that was the direction the ship was listing. But on the port side, and this was the opposite direction that the ship was listing, due to the list, this would cause all these lifeboats to swing in towards the ship. So, if you tried to lower these lifeboats down, they would just hit the deck. You know, they weren't over the water. And if somehow you could get the port side lifeboats, over the side of the ship and try to lower them away. Well, then those lifeboats would actually be grinding up against the Lusitania's hull. And if they're rubbing up against the hull while they're trying to launch these boats, then there's a thousand things that could go wrong with this lowering away attempt. You know, these lifeboats could get snagged on the hull and that could cause the lifeboat to capsize and spill all of its occupants into the sea. The boat could get damaged and sink when it hits the water. I mean, there's a thousand reasons why you don't want to launch a lifeboat from the opposite side of a ship that a ship is listing. However, despite the fact that Captain Turner gave the crew this order, as the situation on the Lusitania became more and more desperate, a few crew members would try to launch some of the port side lifeboats anyway, despite what the captain said. It has been roughly six minutes since torpedo detonation. At this point, the water has almost completely flooded all of the interior spaces in the Lusitania's bow section. Now, as a result of this rapid flooding of the Lusitania's bow, this caused a momentary evening out of the Lusitania's trim. Now, I'm not saying the Lusitania completely evened out. I'd say her 15 degree list to starboard decreased to somewhere between 5 to 10 degrees momentarily. But while this evening out of the ship did help a little bit in launching the Lusitania's lifeboats, it actually caused a good number of the Lusitania's passengers to get the wrong idea as to the true horror they were facing. A good number of the Lusitania's passengers saw this evening out as, of the ship as meaning that the Lusitania's watertight bulkheads were holding and the ship was no longer in danger of sinking. However, they would soon realize that that wasn't the case. Over the course of the next three to four minutes, the full-on evacuation of the Lusitania officially began. It was during this time frame that the crew was doing everything they could to prep and launch as many lifeboats as possible. And yes, this includes the lifeboats on the port side of the ship, but more on that in a minute. Now, it was also during this time frame that more and more passengers were making their way up onto the Lusitania's boat deck. And once these passengers reached the deck, they were heading to whatever lifeboat they could to try to escape the ship on that boat. Now, one thing you need to remember here is the evacuation of the Lusitania was nothing like the evacuation of the Titanic, at least during the early stages of the sinking of the Titanic. There was a lot more chaos on the boat deck of the Lusitania than there was the Titanic, and this really is no surprise considering how fast the Lusitania was going down. Now, I'm not going to go as far and say that it was every man for himself type of chaos. There was some order on the Lusitania's deck during the evacuation. But still, when you compare it to how civil the evacuation of the Titanic was during the early stages of the sinking, 
Yeah, the evacuation of the Lusitania was nothing like that. As all of these people tried to make their way up to the boat decks, they were running every which way, and the crew of the Lusitania was doing everything they could to keep order on the Lusitania's decks, while at the exact same time trying to prep and launch as many lifeboats as they could. And all the while, the situation of the Lusitania's sinking was getting more and more desperate. So, with all of this information in mind, as you can imagine, trying to escape the Lusitania in one of the ship's lifeboats was not a very easy thing to do. And honestly, it didn't matter if you were trying to escape the Lusitania on the starboard or port side. Both sides had their dangers you had to deal with. Now, granted, it was more dangerous to try to escape the Lusitania on the port side than the starboard. But hey, the starboard side wasn't that safe either. And in case you're wondering what was so risky about trying to escape the Lusitania on the starboard side, well, I'll explain. You see, when trying to escape the Lusitania from the ship's starboard side and get into one of the starboard side lifeboats, due to the Lusitania's very sharp list to starboard, this caused all of these lifeboats, when they were put onto the Lusitania's lifeboat davits, to swing out away from the ship. So what that means is, if you're standing on the Lusitania's deck and you want to try to get into one of these lifeboats, you would literally have to jump from the Lusitania's deck out over the sea and into this lifeboat. I mean, can you just imagine how terrifying this must have been? And depending on where you were and at what point in the sinking you were trying to escape the Lusitania, there was sometimes a distance from the deck to the lifeboat of around four to five feet that people would have to jump. I mean, I honestly can't even imagine how terrifying this must have been. Now, a good number of passengers were able to successfully make the jump into the lifeboat, but a good number of passengers also didn't make the jump. And when they attempted to do so, they tripped, fell from the lifeboat, and fell into the sea far below. However, if you consider how dangerous it was for the Lusitania's crew to be trying to launch the ship's lifeboats from the Lusitania's starboard side, well, I would argue that it would be near, if not completely impossible, to launch any of the Lusitania's lifeboats from the port side, given how far to starboard the Lusitania was listing. There were several attempts by the Lusitania's crew to launch some of the port side lifeboats from the Lusitania's deck. However, what this crew had to do first was muscle the boat over the ship's side and then attempt to lower it away. Almost every single lifeboat that was launched on the port side ended up capsizing due to the boat rubbing up against the Lusitania's hull. There was only one boat that was successfully launched from the Lusitania's port side, which you're seeing now in this animation. However, on its way to the sea, this boat ended up capsizing several times and spilled most of its occupants into the water. The boat was successfully launched, however, most of its occupants did have to swim back into the boat after it touched down. The occupants in this lifeboat were very lucky, to say the least. So, ultimately, how did the evacuation of the Lusitania end up turning out? Was the crew successful in launching a good number of the ship's lifeboats, and were they successful in saving a good number of those that were on board the Lusitania on the day of the sinking? Well, while it is true that the crew was able to launch some of the ship's lifeboats before the ship went down, and while it's also true they were successful in saving a good number of those who were on board the ship on the day of the sinking, as a whole, the evacuation of the Lusitania did not turn out all that well. You see, the Lusitania had 48 lifeboats on board, and with those lifeboats, the ship had more than enough lifeboats to hold everybody on board the ship without any issue whatsoever. However, Due to the dire circumstances that everybody on board the ship was facing, and due to how fast the Lusitania was sinking, well, ultimately, the crew of the Lusitania were only able to launch seven lifeboats before the ship went down. And of those seven lifeboats, only five boats were launched without the lifeboats capsizing or having some kind of major issue during the lowering away process. Now, the five lifeboats that were launched successfully and without any major incident were launched from the Lusitania's starboard side. The other two lifeboats were launched from the port side. One of the port side lifeboats that was launched was the lifeboat that I showed earlier in that animation. And the other lifeboat that was launched, well, it was stored at the very back of the ship and it ended up capsizing as the Lusitania sank. So while this boat did float away from the ship capsized, it was able to save lives. Lifeboat number two that we talked about in the last video, the one that got stuck underneath the Lusitania's port side bridge wing, this boat did end up floating away from the Lusitania. However, the rain holes in the bottom of the boat, these holes weren't filled up before the boat floated away or they weren't capped. And this lifeboat ended up sinking shortly after the Lusitania went down. 
It has now been 10 minutes since torpedo detonation, and the Lusitania's starboard list is starting to return with a vengeance. The vessel was rapidly leaning over to her starboard side. Also at this time, the Lusitania's forecastle, aka the deck above the ship's bow, was starting to submerge. Now when the Lusitania's forecastle went underwater, the Lusitania's rate of sinking only accelerated from this point forward. Now, the ship was still moving forward by the power of its own momentum at this time. However, the ship was proceeding much more slowly than what she was before. At this time, the ship was moving forward at a speed of somewhere between 5 to 10 knots. Now, at this point in time, those still on board the Lusitania had to face a difficult choice. They could either decide to try to remain on the Lusitania and ride the ship down as she sinks, make an attempt to escape the ship in one of the Lusitania's lifeboats, or jump from the ship and try to swim away from the vessel. Now, I don't know about all of you, but if I was a passenger on board the Lusitania trying to escape the ship, and I saw all the chaos that was unfolding with the lifeboats as the crew attempted to launch them, then I would go nowhere near those lifeboats. What I would try to do is simply walk to the bow of the Lusitania and then just swim away from the ship and then take my chances in the water. I'm sure that I could find some debris to float on or maybe get into a lifeboat that doesn't have a lot of people in it and it's already been launched. That would be what I would do. But still, even if you're going to try to swim away from a ship, there's always the risk of not being able to find a lifeboat, not being able to find something to cling to and float on in the water because even if you are a very good swimmer, you can't swim forever. You're going to get tired eventually. So what's the one thing that you need before you swim away from a sinking ship? A life jacket. Now, it is true that the Lusitania did have enough life jackets on board for everyone, but you see, if you were on the deck at the time of the sinking, you would notice that a good number of passengers didn't have their life jackets on. And this was because all of the life jackets on the Lusitania were stored in each passenger's stateroom. So that means that if you wanted a life jacket to use to try to escape the sinking ship, you would have to venture inside the rapidly sinking Lusitania, go back to your cabin, get your life jacket, and then head back up to the boat deck. And as you can imagine, there weren't that many people on board the ship that wanted to take that risk. However, I did find the story of one passenger and his mission to go and retrieve a life jacket from his cabin that I thought was absolutely unbelievable. The passenger that I'm referring to here is this man. His name was Dwight Harris. Now, Dwight Harris was so concerned about his safety during this particular voyage of the Lusitania, and he did not trust that the life jackets supplied to him by the Canard Line were safe. So, what he decided to do was, before he left on board the Lusitania in New York City, he went out and had a custom-made life jacket prepared for him, and he kept this life jacket stored in his stateroom. Now, at the time of the torpedo detonation, Dwight Harris wasn't in his cabin. He was out exploring the ship. And after the Lusitania began to sink, he hung out on the boat deck for a while. Around 10 minutes following the torpedo detonation, Dwight Harris made his way to a railing that was located just in front of the Lusitania's bridge and was looking down from this railing at the Lusitania's forecastle deck. At this point, he noticed that the forecastle was beginning to dip beneath the surface. He decided at this time, this was the moment to act. He had to do something now if he was going to try to save his life. But Dwight Harris also wanted nothing to do with the Lusitania's lifeboats. He considered those a death trap considering everything he had just seen with the boats. So, Dwight Harris slid down from the railing on the upper deck and stood on the Lusitania's forecastle deck. He watched the water slowly coming up the deck and thought to himself, okay, I'm just going to step off this deck and jump into the sea and swim away from the vessel. Now, keep in mind, at this time, Dwight Harris had not yet returned to his cabin to retrieve his life jacket. He wasn't wearing one at this moment. He was afraid to go back to his cabin to retrieve his custom-made life jacket because, due to how fast the ship was going, he was afraid of being trapped inside the vessel. A valid fear, if you ask me. However, just before he jumped into the sea, he thought better of it and thought to himself, I should probably go back to my cabin and retrieve my life jacket. So he walked back up onto a higher deck on the Lusitania and headed inside the ship back to his cabin to retrieve his life jacket. He commented later that this was very difficult considering how far down the ship had gone and the list of the ship made it very difficult to walk in the interior spaces of the vessel. He was successful in retrieving his life jacket and at this point he returned to the Lusitania's forecastle which at this point was beginning to rapidly submerge and simply jumped from the deck and into the sea. He said a giant wave showed up and began pushing him after the vessel. Once Dwight Harris swam clear of the Lusitania, he said he turned around and looked back at the ship. He said what stood out to him the most was the Lusitania's massive funnels as they slowly moved past him against the sky. Dwight Harris would end up surviving the sinking of the Lusitania. 
It has now been 14 minutes since torpedo detonation. At this point in time, the Lusitania's forecastle was nearly completely submerged. However, even at this late stage in the sinking, Captain Turner, along with several of his officers, were still on the Lusitania's bridge. Now, by this point, Captain Turner would have known for certain that the Lusitania was going to sink, and he knew it was about to happen. So, he decided in that moment that he was going to release the few officers he had on the bridge and give them a chance to save themselves. However, before he did this, he asked one of his officers for one final readout of the Lusitania spirit gauge. And in case you don't know what a spirit gauge is, it's what they use on ships to determine how much of a list a vessel has. The final readout of the Lusitania spirit gauge was 25 degrees to starboard. Captain Turner could not believe it. So, once he found this out, he let his bridge officers go, and then Captain Turner turned around and put on a life jacket. Now, there was one officer who was on the bridge who saw Captain Turner do this and thought that Captain Turner was going to try to escape the ship with these officers. However, this didn't happen. Captain Turner simply put on the life jacket, and then he turned around and remained on the bridge. Captain Turner decided in that moment that he was going to remain on the Lusitania's bridge until the end. A short distance away from the Lusitania, German U-boat U-20 was still in the area, and on board U-20, its captain, Walter Svieger, was watching the sinking of the Lusitania through U-20's periscope. Svieger said that he could see massive panic on the Lusitania's deck. He saw people running every which way, lifeboats capsizing. He said it was massive chaos on the deck of the Lusitania. Svieger said in that moment that he wished there was something he could do to help some of those on board the Lusitania. Kind of an ironic thing for him to think about if you ask me, considering the fact that he was the one who torpedoed it in the first place, but whatever. Anyway, Svieger said he reached a point where he couldn't watch the sinking of the ship any longer. It was just too horrible for him to watch. So he stopped watching the ship through U-20's periscope, he had the crew turn the submarine around, and U-20 slowly left the site where the Lusitania was sinking and headed further out to sea. U-20, at this point, was beginning its journey home to Germany. The time was 2.25 p.m., 15 minutes since torpedo detonation. It is now 2.26 p.m., and the Lusitania is beginning to drop like a rock. The Lusitania's forecastle is completely submerged, the Lusitania's starboard side bridge wing is also completely submerged, and the Lusitania's starboard side boat deck is rapidly dropping beneath the surface. On the Lusitania's bridge, Captain Turner, who was still on the bridge, walked upwards onto the Lusitania's port side bridge wing. He would remain here until the water washed him away, which was about to happen in the next minute or so. Now, as the Lusitania continued to sink, its starboard list continued to grow, until the Lusitania's port side propellers came clear of the water. Now, there was one survivor of the Lusitania who said that at this moment, he saw a man jump from the Lusitania's port side stern section, and as he fell from the ship, his leg made contact with one of the Lusitania's propellers, and the propeller sliced his leg clean off. This man fell into the sea, and was never seen again. As the Lusitania continued to founder, the vessel's starboard list continued to grow more and more until her starboard list reached a maximum angle of what is believed to be 45 degrees to starboard. Now, when this happened, this is when the sinking of the Lusitania became rather odd. And when I say odd, what I mean is the way the Lusitania foundered during her final moments was very weird when you compare it to how ships traditionally sink. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, I'll explain. You see, if you compare the sinking of the Lusitania to another ship, and let's just use the Britannic as an example here. Okay, so the Britannic hit a mine on the Britannic starboard side, and the Britannic always had a starboard list as the sinking of the Britannic continued out, or played out, I should say. However, during the Britannic's final moments, the ship's bow went under the surface, and then the stern of the Britannic rose up out of the water a bit, and then with its stern sticking up out of the water, the Britannic slowly slipped beneath the surface. This is how you traditionally think a ship will go down, you know, if she takes damage on the bow, the bow goes down first, the stern rises up, and then the ship goes beneath the surface. However, the Lusitania didn't do this. The way the Lusitania foundered was very odd, and it's very different than what you expect a ship to do as it sinks. And in case you're wondering what the Lusitania did, well, I'll explain. All right, so I want you to pay close attention to how the Lusitania is currently resting in the water. You can see that the bow of the Lusitania is beneath the surface, and you can see that the stern of the ship is starting to rise up. And you can also see the ship's massive starboard list. Now, at this point, you would expect the Lusitania's bow to keep going down first, and then the stern of the ship to continue to climb higher and higher up out of the water. However, this doesn't happen. You see, at this moment, the sinking of the Lusitania momentarily stalls. 
and then once this stall happens, the ship begins to drop like a rock. However, when the ship begins its final plunge, the bow of the Lusitania doesn't drop first and cause the stern to continue to climb higher and higher into the air. It's more like the entire ship simply begins to drop straight down at the angle that the vessel is currently at. And as this happens, the vessel's starboard list begins to even out. It doesn't completely even out, but when the ship disappears, they believe that her massive list to starboard had returned to maybe roughly a 5 to 10 degree list to starboard. And the reason they think this happened was, as the vessel continued to founder, a lot of her port side porthole windows were left open. So they think as the water rushed in through those porthole windows, this caused the vessel's list to begin to more or less even out. As the Lusitania slowly dropped beneath the surface, the last parts of the ship to disappear beneath the surface were the Lusitania's massive funnels and mast. That's another thing that I've always found strange about the sinking of the Lusitania, is that her funnels did not fall over until the vessel disappeared. They were the last parts of the ship to be seen by the survivors as the Lusitania sank out from underneath them. So, it's like I said, the sinking of the Lusitania was definitely odd, you know? She did not sink in a way that you would traditionally expect a vessel to go down, you know? She did initially, you know, she took damage at the bow part, the bow of the ship went down, the stern started to rise up, but then it's like once it reached this maximum angle with her stern sticking up a little bit, it's like the vessel simply just dropped straight down. So, my best guess as to why it may have happened like this is maybe the water just simply began to rush completely through the back part of the ship and then that's why the vessel began to just drop straight down because there were still a lot of air pockets in the top decks of the ship that were keeping the stern from rising up too high i mean it's just weird you know and then the porthole windows came out went underwater so that helped bring the ship back to an even trim so there was that factor but Regardless, as I said, the sinking of the Lusitania was definitely strange. But believe it or not, right before the funnels of the Lusitania dipped beneath the surface, there were three survivors who were swimming from the ship, and believe it or not, inside the Lusitania's funnels, well, at the time that the top of them went underwater, they were still dry inside of the funnels. There was no water in there yet. And this caused a momentary whirlpool to form. And this sucked three people inside one of the Lusitania's massive funnels. And when this happened, all three of them said to themselves, okay, this is it, we're about to die, this is it. And then just as they went into the funnel, something inside the ship exploded, I would guess probably a boiler. And then this eruption of steam shot all three of them out of the funnel. They were covered in coal dust, but they did survive the sinking. I mean, wow, I mean, you can only call that a miracle. There's no other word for it. These three survived the sinking of the Lusitania by nothing short of a miracle. Then, just 18 minutes after torpedo detonation, the RMS Lusitania sank beneath the surface. When this vessel sank, it threw 1,959 people into the Atlantic Ocean, and of that number, 1,197 people would lose their lives when the vessel went down. On Friday, May 7th, 1915, at precisely 2.28 p.m., 18 minutes after being torpedoed by German U-boat U-20, the RMS Lusitania sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. When this ship went down, she took 1,959 people that were on board the ship and threw them into the cold Atlantic Ocean. Now keep in mind that the ocean around the site that the Lusitania went down was nowhere near as cold as it was on the night that the Titanic sank, so it wouldn't kill right away. However, the water around the site that the Lusitania sank was cold enough that if rescue didn't arrive on site soon, then everybody who was on board the RMS Lusitania when she sank really did have the risk of freezing to death in the cold Atlantic Ocean. Now, just to give you all a little bit of context here, the water temperature around the site that the RMS Titanic went down at was roughly 28 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 2 degrees Celsius. Now, let's compare that water temperature to that of the water that was around the site that the Lusitania went down in. At the site that the Lusitania sank, the water temperature on that particular day was roughly 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 degrees Celsius. So, as you can see, the water temperature was nowhere near as cold around the site that the Lusitania sank as it was around the Titanic. However, that is still very cold water. Now, in case you're wondering how long somebody can last in water of that temperature, let's turn to my favorite Titanic book on a sea of glass, because it does have a chart in it 
that tells you how long people can survive in various water temperatures. So according to this book, in water that is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're, we're talking about the water temperature around the site that the Titanic sank, you would be expected to survive roughly 15 to 45 minutes. They think you would lose consciousness in around 15 minutes and that your heart would stop within 15 to 45 minutes. So very low survival time in the water around the site of the Titanic sank. Now let's compare that to the Lusitania. Around the site of the Lusitania sank, it would expect somebody to lose consciousness within one to two hours. You know, that's when the effects of hypothermia would begin to kick in and an expected survival time of one to six hours. So as you can see, the people around the site that the Lusitania sank were definitely at risk of freezing to death if help did not reach them in time. However, help was on the way. Word of the disaster had already reached London and they were working to try to get a rescue fleet out to the site that the Lusitania sank as soon as possible. The rescue mission was going to be launched from the town of Queenstown, which was roughly 20 miles or so from the site that the Lusitania sank. One of the first ships to begin leaving Queenstown was the HMS Juno, a military vessel that could reach the site that the Lusitania sank in less than an hour. However, right after the Juno left port, the Admiralty sent an urgent message to the Juno telling it to return to port and not to go to the site that the Lusitania went down. The reason the Admiralty did this was because they were afraid that the Juno would be torpedoed by German U-boat U-20 because they didn't know if it was still in the area or not. And where the Juno was a very valuable military vessel, they did not want to risk losing the ship. Instead, they decided to send a small fleet of smaller ships that would take a little bit more time to reach the site that the Lusitania sank. However, these ships were nowhere near as valuable to the Admiralty as the Juno was. So this was the plan that the Admiralty set in motion to rescue the Lusitania survivors. Now, it would take this fleet of smaller ships somewhere between three to four hours to reach the site that the Lusitania went down at. And where we discussed the water temperature earlier in this video, you all should know perfectly well that this was really pushing it in terms of survival time for all of those who were struggling in the water around the site that the Lusitania went down at. However, there may be a ship that would be able to reach the site that the Lusitania went down at much sooner. There was a British oil tanker close by, and this ship was known as the Nargaset, and I hope I said that name right. You see, this vessel picked up the Lusitania's distress call, and once it heard it, it changed course immediately and began to head for the site that the Lusitania went down at. However, due to this ship's position at the time that it changed course to head for the Lusitania site, well, it ended up sailing directly in front of German U-boat U-20. And of course, Captain Sphere spotted it immediately as it headed towards the Lusitania's sinking site. And what did Sphere do? Well, he immediately armed another torpedo on U-20 and prepared to torpedo the vessel. He got U-20 into position and fired one torpedo at it. Now, luckily, this torpedo missed the ship, so the vessel wasn't damaged at all in this attack. Now, after this failed torpedo attack, Captain Speaker only had one torpedo left, and he needed it for the return journey, so he simply had U-20 sail away from the area. However, when that tanker ship spotted that torpedo, it assumed that the distress call from the Lusitania was a fake distress call sent from U-20. So at this point, this tanker just simply changed course and headed back out to sea and didn't pay any more attention to the story of the Lusitania. Had that ship been able to respond to the Lusitania's distress call and had U-20 not try to torpedo it, well, this vessel could have made it to the site that the Lusitania sank in probably roughly 30 minutes following the sinking. So this failed attack by U-20 definitely put all those who were struggling in the waters around the site that the Lusitania sank in much more jeopardy. It took four hours for the rescue fleet to arrive at the site where the Lusitania went down. And once they got there, they began to pick up as many people as possible from the waters surrounding the wreck site. As the rescue operation was completed, they then took all of the survivors back to Queenstown. The survivors arrived in Queenstown at roughly 7 or 8 p.m. that evening, and all the survivors began walking ashore. Once the survivors went ashore, they discovered how truly terrible the situation really was. Of the 1,962 people that were on board the Lusitania, only 761 survived the sinking. And of that number, only 35 of 129 children that were on board the Lusitania survived the sinking. And only four out of 39 babies survived the sinking of the ship. However, it was quickly discovered that one person who no one expected to survive the sinking of the Lusitania, in fact, did survive. 
Captain Turner, who was on the bridge of the Lusitania until the very end, was washed out of the bridge from the, on the Lusitania's port side. And then once he was adrift in the ocean, he was then knocked unconscious, but he was kept up and, and alive by his life jacket. He was found out cold in the water and a rescue ship brought him aboard and took him to Queenstown, at which point Captain Turner did make a full recovery. Immediately following the sinking of the RMS Lusitania, there was a massive international outcry and condemnation against Germany. People simply could not believe that Germany would go out and attack and sink a passenger liner like the Lusitania. Now, in an attempt to calm the anger, Germany gave several reasons as to why they believed that they had every right to sink the Lusitania, and I'm going to tell you those reasons here in a second. Now, the first reason they said they had every right to sink the ship was due to the fact that they put a warning in the New York City newspaper leading up to the sailing of the Lusitania. They said, because we put this warning in the paper, everybody who sailed on the ship knew what they were getting into, so Germany could not be held responsible for any of the innocent lives lost on this ship due to this warning. The second reason they claimed that they had every right to sink the ship was due to the fact that the Lusitania was classified as a military vessel. They also said that the ship was armed and that it was carrying munitions. Now, while it was technically true that the Lusitania was classified as a military vessel, officially the ship was known as an auxiliary cruiser, the claim that the ship was armed was simply not true. The Lusitania was not armed in any way, shape, or form on this voyage. I don't think she was ever armed throughout the entire war. Now, when Germany claimed that the RMS Lusitania was carrying munitions, this wasn't just a false claim that they made by just saying, oh yeah, we sunk the ship because we knew it was carrying munitions. They actually had a little bit of evidence to back up their claim that the ship was carrying munitions. Although, technically speaking, the munitions they were referring to wasn't classified as munitions at all. It was actually classified as small arms ammunition and stuff. You see, on the Lusitania's public manifesto, it stated that the Lusitania was carrying some small arms ammunition on board. So like rifle cartridges, unexplosive fuses, things of that nature. And when the German embassy over in the US saw this, this is what they used to try to back up their claim that yeah, they had every right to sink the Lusitania. However, if you take a look at cruiser rules, the cruiser rules state that a ship like the Lusitania wasn't allowed to carry munitions. And when they say that the ship isn't allowed to carry munitions, they're referring to more high-grade military explosives and things of that nature. You know, things to be used in major weapons of war, not just rifle ammo and unexplosive fuses and stuff like that. So, technically speaking, if the Lusitania was only carrying this stuff, it wasn't violating cruiser rules. But here's where the first sign of controversy comes into play. You see, Unofficially, the Lusitania was actually carrying some more high-grade military equipment on board that would be classified as illegal under cruiser rules. You see, unofficially, the Lusitania was also carrying 46 tons of aluminum powder, which was used in the manufacturing of high-grade explosives. It was also carrying 50 cases of bronze powder, and it was also carrying a very large quantity of gun cotton. However, none of this stuff was classified on the ship's manifesto or listed on the ship's manifesto. And if it had been public knowledge, well, it wouldn't have been good for the Lusitania. Now, the fact that the Lusitania was carrying the small arms ammunition was public knowledge that was available to anybody in the States. Anybody could look that up. However, this bit of information was kept secret over in the UK. However, no one knew that the ship was actually carrying this more high-grade military equipment on board. However, despite these claims by Germany, it did nothing to calm the anger. In fact, you could even say that it made the anger towards Germany even worse. President Woodrow Wilson was furious at Germany for sinking the Lusitania, and he thought it would eventually bring the U.S. into the war. However, as more time went by, photos and video showcasing how horrible the disaster truly was began to make their way around the Allied nations, and the anger towards Germany continued to grow. Now, the British Admiralty noticed how much anger the public had towards Germany as a result of the sinking of the Lusitania. So what they decided to do was release a series of propaganda posters to try to entice more people to join the war effort against Germany. These posters would show the sinking of the ship, it would depict the victims of the sinking, and the posters would say things like, uh, avenge your fellow Irishmen, join the war effort. So, as you can see, the British government really did try to capitalize the sinking to their advantage and use it to help win the war sooner. 
One month after the sinking of the Lusitania, an official inquiry was held in London where they were going to discuss the sinking of the ship. They called Captain Turner, several members of his crew, and several passengers who survived the sinking of the Lusitania into the inquiry to discuss everything that happened with the ship. Another reason why they decided to hold this inquiry into the sinking of the Lusitania was because they wanted to find out who was truly at fault for the sinking of the ship. Now, while it was true that it was common knowledge that Germany was the one who ultimately sunk the Lusitania when they torpedoed it, they wanted to find out if there was any fault to be had on that of the British government, Captain Turner, his crew, you know. They wanted to see if anything could have been done differently to help protect and safeguard the Lusitania. They also wanted to see if Captain Turner and his crew had made any mistakes that could have, if they hadn't have made these mistakes, maybe this horrible disaster would have never happened in the first place. The head of the inquiry was going to be this man. His name was Lord Mersey. And, fun fact, this man was actually the head of the British inquiry into the Titanic disaster that occurred a few years earlier. However, after the inquiry started, this was the time period that Lord Mersey noticed something odd. It seemed like that everything wasn't as it seemed with the inquiry into the sinking of the Lusitania. The first sign of trouble was when Lord Mersey noticed that there were only 46 witnesses called to testify about the sinking of the Lusitania. This was a surprise to him considering how many people actually survived the sinking of the ship and their testimony could be very helpful in figuring out what really happened with the sinking of the ship. Now, Lord Mersey went to the British Admiralty and asked why only 46 witnesses were called to testify about this and they completely blew him off. They did not answer any of Lord Mersey's questions. Now, most of the inquiry was held in public. You know, people could watch it and, you know, see what was going on. However, there were several, there were several sessions where everything was private and held behind closed doors. And during these private sessions, the British Admiralty did something odd. They completely went after Captain Turner. They completely tried to say that he was incompetent. He ignored their orders. You know, they said, oh, we told you to do this, but you ignored it and did this instead. Even though Captain Turner had every reason to do what he did. And when he tried to say, this is why I did this, this is why I did this, this is why I did this, they completely ignored it. They, they just, they would not hear what Captain Turner had to say. And then something else odd happened as well. You see, a lot of people were talking about how only one torpedo was responsible for sinking the Lusitania. However, all the people that were called to testify in the inquiry, well, they only selected people to come and talk if they said they thought two or maybe even three torpedoes sunk the ship. So it's like they were trying to hide the fact that only one torpedo was responsible for sinking the Lusitania. And at the time, Lord Mersey had no idea why. Now, as more time went by, Lord Mersey was beginning to suspect that something foul may be at play here. He was starting to suspect that maybe the British Admiralty was trying to cover something up with the way that they were going after Captain Turner. Now, eventually, the British Admiralty would realize that they weren't getting anywhere with Lord Mersey when they were trying to go after Captain Turner. And... It got to the point where the British Admiralty actually came forward at the inquiry with so-called evidence that they were going to use to try to implement Captain Turner in the sinking of the Lusitania. This evidence that they presented was a series of documents that showed messages that they claimed that they sent to ships that warned them that U-boats were in an area that Lusitania was going to be sailing into. However, the thing is, these messages never existed in the first place. These warnings were never sent to any ships about these submarines. So, as it turns out, and Lord Mersey discovered this a little bit more investigating, these documents, well, the British Admiralty actually prepared two different sets of documents to be used in the case against Turner. But depending on if this inquiry session was held in private or public, that would depend on which documents were presented to evidence. So, as you can really see, the British Admiralty was really out for Captain Turner. And once Lord, M Lord Mersey realized what the British Admiralty was doing, he was a lot more critical of them. But evidence was starting to pile up that maybe the British Admiralty was definitely trying to cover something up. And as it turns out, they were trying to cover up quite a few things. And I'll explain what they are in just a second. Now, the first thing that they were trying to cover up, which the British Admiralty has never admitted to, but we can figure this out by examining the available evidence, was the fact that the Lusitania was, in fact, carrying munitions on board. And 
They were trying to cover this up by only letting people testify who said that they thought two or three torpedoes struck the Lusitania and not one like what really happened. Shoot, even Captain Turner said that he knew that only one torpedo struck the ship, but after, during the official inquiries, he said that two struck the ship. So it's like, they were even talking to him about trying to cover up the fact that only one torpedo struck the Lusitania. And the reason why they were trying to sell the story that two or three torpedoes struck the Lusitania and not one like what really happened was because they may have been concerned that her illegal munitions cargo may have exploded when the single torpedo struck the Lusitania. So because they were trying to cover up this fact, they were selling the story of two or three torpedo strikes and not one like what really happened. Now, the second thing that they were trying to cover up was something called Room 40. Now, Room 40 was top secret at the time of the First World War. And what it was, was it was a part of the British Admiralty where its primary objective was to pick up and decipher German wireless messages. You see, Germany was using the Marconi wireless system, just like all ships were during that time period, but they were, they were encoding all of their messages with this code so that no one could read what these wireless messages said. However, Room 40 had deciphered the code and they were reading every single message that these submarines were sending out during the First World War. But they didn't want this, they didn't want the Germans to find out about it, so it's like they were trying to blame Turner for the sinking to pull attention away from that. Now, here's where the real big conspiracy kicks in with the Lusitania, because there's all kinds of controversy with it. It seems like, and again, this has never been admitted to, but it seems like the British Admiralty knew that U-20 was in the area that the Lusitania was about to steam into. Because what you guys may not know is, Room 40 had been monitoring U-20 for about a month leading up to the sinking of the Lusitania. They picked up all of these wireless transmissions from the U-20 submarine. And the day before the Lusitania crossed paths with U-20, U-20 actually torpedoed several ships that were directly in front of the Lusitania's path, and the Admiralty and Room 40 knew all about this. However, no messages were sent to the Lusitania about these attacks. Captain Turner had no idea. Now, the head of the Canard Line found out about it, and he went and pleaded with the Admiralty the day before the Lusitania went down to warn the Lusitania and have the ship be diverted away from where U-20 was. They, he even told the Admiralty to tell the Lusitania to take a northbound course above Ireland instead of going south. You know, by doing this, it would safeguard Lusitania from U-20. Now, because of the head of the Canard Line's pleas, the British Admiralty did send a message to the Lusitania. However, this message wasn't what the head of the Canard Line wanted the Admiralty to send to the ship. This message was that very cryptic, unhelpful message that we discussed in an earlier video. The message simply told the Lusitania that there are U-boats ahead of you and behind you. The message didn't tell the Lusitania about the attack where the U-20 U-boats sunk those ships directly ahead of the Lusitania's course, and the message definitely didn't tell the Lusitania to change course and take a northern route above Ireland instead of the southern route. So, the British Admiralty did not want this to become public knowledge. But, because of all of this, it seems like that maybe, just maybe, the British Admiralty was hoping to put the Lusitania at risk. Now, in case you're wondering, why would the British Admiralty do this? Why on earth would they put the RMS Lusitania at risk? Well, if you take a look at all the evidence, it seems like they were attempting to use the sinking of the Lusitania as a way to pull the U.S. into the war against Germany. Winston Churchill even said in a letter that we must continue to attract neutral shipping to the shores of Great Britain as a way to try to entice the U.S. to enter the war with Germany. Now, it wasn't just this one claim and all the stuff that we've already talked about in the video that makes people think that something more shady was at play with the sinking of the Lusitania. There was actually other evidence as well. And the biggest one was, why did the British Admiralty fail to provide destroyer escort to the Lusitania? You see, that was something else that people talked about. The Lusitania was supposed to be protected by the Navy as the ship approached the UK coastline. 
And when they were, when the British Admiralty was asked if they were going to protect the Lusitania as it got closer, they shrugged it off and said that we can't protect every single ship that comes our way. We just don't have the resources for it. However, that wasn't true because there were several military ships that were available to protect the Lusitania docked in Queenstown that were not doing anything. But the British Admiralty did not send them out to help the Lusitania. So when you factor in a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in this video, while we can't say for certain, it definitely does look like that something more shady was at play here. Now I do want to clarify one detail here. I want you all to know that I do not think that the British Admiralty intentionally sunk the Lusitania. And what I mean is, I don't believe that they were directly responsible for the sinking of the ship. I don't want you all to think that at all. However, what I do think may have happened was, maybe a few of the highest ranking members of the British Admiralty at the time, well, maybe they decided to let the Lusitania sail towards the UK more exposed than she should have been. And... Maybe they were hoping because of this, the Lusitania would be attacked, and then they could use this as a means to pull the U.S. into the war. Now, by default, I'm not a person who really puts a lot of faith in conspiracy theories. By default, I don't usually believe them at all. However, when you really study the sinking of the Lusitania, it's hard to look at this entire disaster and not think that there was some kind of conspiracy at play here, especially when you study all of the evidence. So... Now you all see firsthand why the sinking of the Lusitania is so controversial and why people still have a lot of questions about this sinking to this day. Now eventually, Lord Mersey would resign as head of the inquiry into the whole Lusitania affair. He basically just had enough with all the shady behavior that was going on. When he was later asked about it, he said that the whole Lusitania affair was a complete mess and he wanted nothing more to do with it. That should tell you how bad things were if the head of an inquiry was to resign. Good gosh. Anyway, eventually Captain Turner and the British Admiralty were cleared of all wrongdoing in the whole Lusitania affair. They said that blame for the Lusitania disaster rested completely on Germany because they torpedoed the ship. Now, it would take another two years before the U.S. would enter the First World War. And while the Lusitania sinking wasn't the primary reason as to why the U.S. got involved in the war, it was a big factor. But yeah, guys, now you guys see why the sinking of the Lusitania was very controversial. There's still a lot of mysteries about the Lusitania that we do not have any information on to this day. If you go and look at the official inquiries into the disaster, you'll notice that documents from the inquiry are completely missing. You know, there's still a lot of secret information about that. And in the 1930s, people said that they could see British ships bombing the wreck of the Lusitania. Now, this, they're like, why was this happening? You know, why were they bombing the wreck of the ship? It almost seemed like that there was something to hide there. However, if you want to know the official reason why they said that the ship was bombed, well, they claimed that they thought that they were U-boats from the Second World War. You know, because they said that the wreck of the Lusitania showed up on, like, their primitive sonar technology, and it made it look like U-boats. So maybe that was why they attacked the ship. However, still kind of shady, if you ask me. It's very, eh. But anyway, despite all of its controversy, the sinking of the Lusitania was a great tragedy, and so many innocent people lost their lives when this terrible disaster occurred. So I think we should each and every single one of us do our part to remember the disaster and remember all of those who lost their lives on that ship and pay respect to them so their memory will never be forgotten. All right, everybody. Well, hey, that concludes the complete Lusitania timeline series. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure you leave it a like. Be sure to subscribe down below. And thank you all so much for tuning in. You all are awesome. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I will see you all in the next one. Have a great day, everybody. Special thanks to our Captain Level Patreon supporter, Dakota Charbonneau. Thank you so much for all the support, man.